Live. Going live. Wait. Hey, it's live. It's live. It's live. Yay. All right. Hello, everyone. So we've got Carl. Hello. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Kings Rook. I only had to restart X split about three times tonight. Oh, good lord. Um, who knows what's going on in my hair? I don't recommend um, cutting your own hair. Although, I don't think I did too bad a job. Just, yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Peter Dawson, hello. King's Rook, hello. Carl Gasman, hello. Dunrick Ironhammer, hello. Um, there is something going on about the Blackburn Blackburn already. That's always vaguely scary. Hopefully this is working, and hopefully it's not dropping frames. Um, hello, Kings. Oh, hello, Carl Gasberg. Hello, Cahedron. All hail the Catalina. It's getting scary now. Hello, Jess P. Hello, Dan Freeman. How are you doing? Hope you're not working too hard in hospitals. Um, hello, my Mateusz Slavik. Hello. Hello, DGB40. Hello, Greg Starsky. Hello, Nautical Wolf. Hello. Ooh. <laughs> You're praying to the Blackburn Blackburn for expert to work. I don't know. Right. Um, there is one thing. So I'm going to leave you quickly looking at this, uh, the, this lovely pile of books. Because these are the books we're working through for a second. Because my lovely girlfriend has sent me some very nice iron brew, and I'm going to quickly go get the uh, can of iron brew. Hello, Aldi, and hello, Captain Z Fort, and Anna Regola. Hello! Hello, and hello to new viewers, because I do realize we have some new ones. And people are like, cutting hair is a better above the skin than below. It, it, it is. Uh, it's a fun thing. Anyway, as I said, these are the books we're working through today. Hello, Rick Vasa. Hello, Journey of. And I will be back in a second by and break. Sorry, I had put this in the garage to make sure it was appropriately cold. It is, trust me, very, very cold. I could have put it in the freezer, but I would have actually warmed it up in comparison. The garage is very cold today. So, the hospital is busy. We are having issues with oxygen flow as the pipes can't handle it. Have the army helping out. Uh, okay, just make sure, as always, when dealing... Oh, no, I won't make that joke. They're being seriously helpful. I was going to make the joke about not having anything. Uh, making sure everything's tied down. Uh, including any attractive members of staff. But, um, yeah. In this moment, we won't make those jokes. They are the British Army. They're doing a good job. I'm not sure about the idea of making them into a human security force or a humane security force. In my experience, war tends to be won by the side who's prepared to apply the most amount of force, not the one who's prepared to apply it humanely or minimally. Mm-hmm. Right, so, welcome everyone. Um, as you see, I've got the important thing for brew ships. I've got some iron brew. Um, I have lovely cans from my girlfriend, which I store in the garage. And I have down here this to make sure that I don't run out for the entire time. So, you know, plenty of iron brew. 
There we are. Unlike Dr. Clark, my doctor would not approve of my drinking iron brew. <laughs> um... Well, you know, here's the thing about Iron Brew. It's okay in moderation. I, I, I am, I do try and sort of point out this, that sometimes I drink a lot of it when I'm needing to work late at night, and I don't drink coffee. So I don't drink coffee or tea. I don't really drink much Coke, apart from when I can't find Iron Brew. So Iron Brew basically fills the role of coffee and tea for me, as well as a soft drink. So that is probably explains the amount I drink compared to what normally you drink. But also, I go for about three bottles of... Well, actually, just, please take this wrong way. I refill this with tap water because I have Scottish blood. The idea of paying this much for water absolutely freaks me out. But my mum likes it. That's fine. So we get them, and then I make sure to reuse the bottles. Never more than twice, and then they go in the bin. But, you know, I get for about, I, I get for about three bottles loads of water a day as well. So, you know, I'm not all bad. And I don't always have cake for tea. In fact, the only reason I've been having cake for tea at all recently is because, well, it's been Christmas and we ordered, again, to deal with the current COVID scenario, instead of ordering enough, because you're never quite sure you're going to get it, uh, we ordered cake from pretty much every single delivery. So we ended up with about four, and we got cake in every single delivery. It actually all came. So um, we ended up with about five times as much cake as we needed. But it's, you know, life could be worse. You could have had no cake. Is Iron Brew a healthy drink? Well, it is technically marketed as a put in the health drink section of our Asda, but I'm, I think that's, it's more in the sports drink section. <laughs> mm-hmm. Come, how's the new intro idea gone down the crow? Uh, more popular than the idea of making them all sing um, sea shanties, but we're working on both <laughs> for bilge pumps. Right. <laughs> yeah. Reverse. Hello. And no, Ibra is not a healthy drink, but probably better than something I now have in my house that is a drain. <laughs> no, like, you know. <laughs> uh, you're, you're drinking Coke again. It's not practically naked. My, 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 uh, I, I, I've just cut my hair, Jeff. It's not that bad. It's not practically naked. It's just, it's, it's, um, my, my roots, I get very, very blonde, apparently, according to, um, my barber, which is why I often had a conversation with him along the lines of, are you trying to make me bald? Right then. I thought it was beer. It's not beer. No, no, no. It's, Iron Brew is a soft drink. It's not beer. I, believe it or not, I don't need alcohol to be this way. <laughs> Rick Carling has a war in humanity. The side which applies the most force in media propaganda can get away some atrocities. Yeah. So, the other day, I was, of course, reading from this book as part of the introduction to Great White Fleet, and I read the conclusion. And the thing is, that's not really a good example of this book. In that it's very good for what I was talking about in terms of the Great White Fleet, but it doesn't really give you an idea of the quality of history contained what they're in. And so I decided I was going to put this in this thing anyway, because I had 50, I had about, actually, to be honest, I had 13 books in the pile and I went, I'm not doing 13 books. So it was either 14 or 15 was going to be done. And so both the books from the Great White Fleet got added in. Evening Jack Hunter. Anonymous, hello. Anyway, so that is why we have got to this.
Right. So. Just sort of pick any chapter because they're all pretty much of the same standard. And this is another reason I wanted to read read this out because I realise I've been saying this is a good history book, but I hadn't given you an example of why it's a good history book. And there's a point at which I often say, well, there are politicians who like lots of politicians like to write history books. Doesn't mean they write good ones. Like good ones are rare. This is Turn of the Tide. The American coast is blockaded, effect of the blockade, raids on the coast, retaliation by the privateers, failure of expectations on both sides, fleets, the true commerce destroyers, the Shannon and Chesapeake, the power of good organization, the Pelican and the Argus, the Enterprise and the Boxer, failure of the attack on Norfolk, outrages at Hampton, inadequacy of the American gunboats, the Yuanan in Delaware Bay, attack on the Asp, capture of the Surveyor, Affair in the Stone River, Capture of the Lottery, Poggingshorn and the Privateers, Cochrane Succeeds Warren, Cruise of the Essex, the Phoebean Cherub, and the Essex and the Essex Junior. Throughout the year of 1812 and the beginning of the year of 1813, Britain had made no effective use whatever of her tremendous power at sea so far as the United States was concerned. She had suffered from overwhelmingly self-confidence in her own prowess and from overweening eating content for her foe. During the first year of the war, the utter futility of the American land attacks on Canada could fairly be matched by the utter inefficiency of the efforts of the British both to destroy the little American navy and to employ their own huge navy so as to make it a determining factor in the struggle. Now, I would like to point out, there is one thing I have a small gripe with and Roosevelt in terms of writing this history. You would think that the only problem the Royal Navy has to deal with in 1812 is the US Navy, so they can concentrate the whole thing. That they're not also worrying about the Spanish Navy, the French Navy, the Dutch Navy, the da Danish Navy, and pretty much other in every, uh, every other Navy in the world, and potentially going over to Napoleon. They are. So that means that, I'm sorry, America is currently getting what remains of the C team, if not some leavenings of the D team being sent there. It's the reality. So, America, you have a small group of ships which are their plucky best. The British equivalent is what is enough force we can possibly dispatch that will not interfere with these other operations, but will not mean we start losing and have a lot to have to regain. It's that complicated. But by the spring of 1813, this was changed. The British were a practical of people, and they faced facts, thereby showing capacity to turn these facts to their own advantage. The dream of British naval invincibility, the dream that British warships could win against any reasonable odds, was a pleasant dream, and the awakening was extremely disagreeable. Nevertheless, a dream it was, and the British recognised it as such, and acted accordingly. With the natural result that thereafter, the Americans suffered more than the British at sea. The 18-pounder frigates were forbidden to engage single-handed the 24-pounder frigates of the Americans, and where possible, uh, where possible, they were directed to cruise in couples or in small, small squadrons, so as to be able to, to overpower any single antagonist, great or small i.e. the British start sending out more because they realise they have managed to cope with the rest of the world's navies. They're dealt with, okay, well, now we do the mopping up operation. No sufficient steps were taken to bring the average standard of fighting efficiency, especially in gunnery, up to the American level. Uh, yes, but the ships turning up were actually crewed by the decent officers, which the Royal Navy had been using to deal with the others. So their standard of gunnery was usually higher anyway. And the other one had learnt their lesson and started being more, more rigorous in their practising. And the ones who didn't found themselves kicked out. But the best captains in the British Navy were already as good as any to be found in America or anywhere else. And it was now the turn of the Americans to suffer from overconfidence, while the British, wherever possible, made dexterous use of their superior forces. In other words, 
the British actually sent a couple of the B team, uh, even one of the A team, out. Sorry to say, but even the B team had more sea time than the A uh, than the Americans. And yes, it does matter. After this period, no British frigate was captured, while three American frigates surrendered, one to an opponent of superior fighting efficiency, and the other two to superior force skillfully used. It's always good when you have that as a reason. The American sloops did better, but even their career was checkered by defeat. Yeah. The important factor on the British side was the use of the navy to blockade the American coast. When war was declared, the Napoleonic struggle was at its height. Thank you for finally pointing this out. And the chances seemed, on the whole, to favour Napoleon. But by the spring of 1813, the Grand Army had gone to its death in the snowland east of Russia, and Wellington had completely bested the French marshals in Spain, so it was merely a question of time as to when he would invade France. In Germany, the French were steadily losing ground, and all the nations of Europe were combining for the overthrow of that splendid evil and terrible genius before whom they had so long cowered. Britain could therefore afford to turn attention to America in earnest. I do love the way he does the American patriotic bit on the first page of the chapter. And then the next page basically goes through going, yeah, this was what was happening. Uh, and yet she could not spare adequate land forces, but she could and did spare a sufficiency of battleships, frigates and sloops to make a real blockade of the American coast. And if you ever want to see something interesting, you see the American frigates going, hang on, that's a battleship. That's also a battleship. Or rather, that's a third rate. That's a third rate. That's a third rate. My escape's going to be first rate. That way, back into harbour. Where did they all come from? Well, we don't need them to blockade Brest. Oh, good for you. After May 1813, the blockade was complete from New York southward. In the autumn, it was extended further east, but it was not until the following year that it was applied with the same iron severity to the New England coast, for the British government hoped always that the seditious spirit in New England would manifest itself in open revolt. Seditious spirit in New England. Remember that, New England? You have a seditious spirit. After the blockade had been once established, commerce ceased, and the only vessels that could slip out were the fast-sailing privateers and regular cruisers, whose captains combined daring, caution, and skill in such equal proportions as to enable them to thread their way through the innumerable dangers that barred their path. The privateers frequently failed, and even the regular cruisers were by no means always successful, while the risks were too great for merchantmen habitually to encounter them. Georgia touched Florida, and so could do a little trade through the Spanish dominions, and the northern New England coast lay open for some time to come, but elsewhere the ships rotted at their ports, though the shipwrights found employment in building the swift privateers and the sailor folk in manning them. The white-sailed British frigates hovered in front of every seaport of note, standing on and off with ceaseless, unwearing vigilance by day and night, in fair weather and foul, through the summer and through the winter, all those years blockading the French. Who would have thought the British would be good at a blockade? In the great to Estrie's fleets rode at anchor, or sailed hither and thither, menacing destruction. No town, large or small, could deem itself safe, and every great river was a possible high road for the entrance of the enemy. There was not a strip of the American coast over which the Americans could call themselves masters, seaward of the point where the water grew deep enough to float a light craft of war. The one lesson which should be most clearly taught by this war is the folly of a nation's relying for safety upon anything but its own readiness to rebel attack. And in the case of uh, in case of a power with an extended seaboard, this readiness implies the possession of a great fighting navy. The other failure of Jefferson's embargo and his other many measures of what he termed peaceful coercion teach their part of the lesson so plainly that it would seem impossible to misread it. But the glory won by their little navy has tended to blind Americans to the fact that this navy was too small to do anything except win glory. It lacked the power to harm anything but Britain's pride, and it was too weak to parry a single blow delivered by the British along the coast. When once they realised their task was serious and set about it in earnest. Twenty ships at a line, as good of their kind as were the frigates and sloops, would have rendered the blockade impossible. 
Even if they had not prevented the war and judged merely from the monetary standpoint, they would have repaid to the nation their cost a thousand times over by the commerce they would have saved and the business losses they would have averted. As it was, the Americans were utterly powerless to offer any effective resistance to the British blockade. For it is too late to try to build a fleet or take any other effective steps when once the war has begun. The nevertheless administration at Washington did not even take steps to defend the capital city. It is the fashion to speak of the people as misrepresented by the politicians, but in this case certainly the people deserve just the government they had. Indeed, it's curious and instructive, as well as melancholy, to see how powerless the Americans as a whole were to make good the shortcomings of which they had been guilty prior to the declaration of war. It is especially instructive for those Americans, and indeed those Englishmen, who are fond of saying that either country needs no protection merely because it cannot be directly invaded by land, and who tried to teach us that immense reserve strength which each, each nation undoubtedly possesses can be immediately drawn on to make good any deficiency to preparation at the outbreak of war. This is much like telling a prize fighter that he need not train because he has such an excellent con constitution that he may draw on it to make good defects in his preparation for the ring. The truth seems to be that, in naval matters especially, nothing can supply the lack of adequate preparation and training before the outbreak of war. The lead which is lost at the beginning cannot be regained save by superhuman effort and after enormous waste of strength. They did call battleship ships on the line then. But Roosevelt is not calling them ships on the line, he's calling them battleships for a reason, because... He's writing this book in 1904 for publication in 1905. This book is a history, and it's a good history, but it also is Roosevelt making the case for spending on the Navy. And it's a good book. It's worth reading. So. Anna, hello. Let's see. Have I missed anyone saying hello to anyone? Hmm. How about, hello, Albert Zasky? Hello, Rob Ola. Hello. <laughs> good evening, Shade F, and good evening, Shimmy. And let's see, Greg Sadowski. Hello. You get a third rate. You get a third rate. Everybody gets a third rate. Oprah, probably. Well, the equivalent of Oprah at the time, which would have been, I don't know, one of the queens. Aviator and Bryce, hello. The War of 1812 is always one that uh, had me scratching my head in history classes, wondering, why did we need to do this war? Well, because they thought they could steal Canada and beat up the British because the British would be beaten by the French. Yes, the Americans bet on the, Brit on the French beating the British. I'm not saying it hasn't happened in history. I'm just saying by the point they make the bet, it hadn't happened for a long time. Jeff Sheila, Beela, HMS Shannon mounted a nine-pounder sniper weapon that kept knocking out USS Chesapeake's helmsmen and officers, such that a midshipman ended up in command while he was taking the captain to safety. <laughs> well, you know, it works. Hmm. <sighs> <sighs> Let's see, any questions? Ah, the politicization of original words. My bre uh, bread and butter. Yes, well, you know, they're using battle he's using battleship rather than first rate or third rate because he's uh, wants his audience to understand what he's saying. Also, he's also not using the phrase ships of the line. He's using battleship. And he's using cruiser a lot to describe frigates. Don't say what British A team in eighteen hundreds doctor called on. Who, uh, who to get his police box tra uh, doctor? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> 
Robo, uh, betting on the French to beat the British sounds like me, uh, to me like com betting on Mexico to completely absorb the US fighting attention. Oh, it's happened a lot in history. There's M Roosevelt mentioned the Great Lakes at all. Yes, the Great Lakes are covered in here. He likes the Great Lakes operations. He mainly likes the commanders in them. Um, it has good things. It's like sort of uh, let's get into. It goes into the high level and also does the lo the uh, sort of low level. It's a sort of what I would call a really good example of the sort of histories you have written in this period. On occasion, the Giron did little better than the gunboats, but she had had uh, had her revenge a month later. On the 29th, she was in Delaware Bay with the ship sloop Martin, 18, Commander Humphrey's uh, Humphrey uh, Fleming seen a sent house. When the latter grounded on the outside of the Crow Shoal, the frigate anchored within supporting distance, and shortly afterwards, the two ships were attacked by a flotilla of ten American gunboats. Besides the usual disadvantages of gunboats, these particular ones suffered under an additional handicap. But their powder was so bad that all the officers had joined in a solemn protest to the Navy Department and had stated that it was unfit for service. The flotilla kept at a distance which permitted an hour's can uh, can cannonading with no damage to anyone. Their own shot fall of failing to reach even the brig, while those of the frigate occasionally passed over them. During the firing, gunboat number 121, sailing master Sheed, drifted a mile and a half away from her consorts. This gave the British an opportunity, of which they took prompt advantage. They made a dash for number 121 in seven boats, containing 140 men under the command of Lieutenant Phil Philip Westphal. Mr. Sheed anchored and made an obstinate defence, but at the second discharge of his long gun, the carriage was almost torn to pieces, and he was reduced to the use of small arms. The British boats advanced steadily, firing their bo boat carronades and, musket um, carronades and musketry, and carried the gunboat by boarding. They not without a loss of three killed or mortally wounded, and four wounded, while seven of the 25 members of the gunboat's crew suffered likewise. At about the same time, the boats of the British brig sloops Contest and Mohawk under the command of Lieutenant Roger Car Carly Curry, made an attack on the little gunboat Asp Free, commanded by Midshipman Sigourney, when she was moored in a in Yakumanko Creek, out of the Chesapeake, on July the 11th. After a murderous conflict in which 11 Americans, including Mr. Sigourney, and 8 British, including Lieutenant Curry, were killed or wounded, the British carried the Asp and set her on fire. However, the surviving Americans, 9 in number, escaped to the shore, rallied under Midshipman McClintock, and as soon as the British retired, boarded the ass, put out the flames, and got her into fighting order. They were not again molested. I'm not sure how a ship that's been burned as badly as the ass was is put back into fighting order, but I presume they put their flag up and said that we will fight if we can, but please don't make us fight. Uh, the, shortly before this, on June 12th, the boats of the British frigate Narcissus, 32 guns, Captain John Richard Lumley, you notice there's a McClintock, a Lumley, these are not exactly names which are unknown in history going on here, uh, containing 50 men under the, the command of Lieutenant John Skiri, captured the little cutter Surveyor 6 under Mr. William S. Travis with a crew of 15 men as she lay in York River out of the Chesapeake. The struggle was brief but bloody, five Americans and nine British being killed or wounded. Lieutenant Curry led his men with great uh, distinguished gallantry and proof. Pardon me and proved himself a generous victor, for he returned Mr. Travis's sword with a letter running, Your gallant and desperate attempt to defend your vessel against more than double your number on the night of the 12th instant excited such admiration on the part of your opponents as I have seldom witnessed, and I am at lost which to admire most, the previous arrangements on board the surveyor or the determined manner in which her, de her deck was disputed inch by inch. On January 1814, in January 1814, the little United States coasting, uh, coasting schooner, Alligator, of four guns and 40 men, sailing master R. Bassett, was attacked by the boats of British frigate and brig after nightfall, while lying at anchor in the mouth of the Stone River, South Carolina. Two of her men were killed and two wounded, but the boats were beaten off with a severe loss, one of them being captured. Do you know if he doesn't name which ships were involved in that one? It's a good history, and it's worth reading. <laughs> 
John Emmett, hello. Alternate history question. Clemson versus 120 gun ship La Orion. How does it? How long does it take the Clemson to sink the first rate? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Let me just. I, 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 for this, I need to check the exact thickness of the Clemson's hull. So the only Clemson I can find, of course, is um, a destroyer for model. Yeah, let's see. Well, he'd commanded the the Summers. Uh, so I'm presuming you mean the Clemson of 1918. In which case, let's see. She's got a uh, four four inch guns. Depends. Can they? Do, are they carrying high explosive instead of armor piercing? Um, if they're carrying high explosive, one shot. If they're carrying armor piercing, it might well go through the wood and come out the other side. In which case, my money might be on the Lorient. Greg Salsa, you mean a Lorient's hull? The Clemson would sit out range. Uh, I was remember in the mind of remembering midshipman Clemson, and I was. Mo to, 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 Quickly changing the Shannon to the Clemson and sort of going, ah, oh, da, da 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 in my head. And then I remembered, no, the Clemson is named for Midshipman Clemson, who served on that sort of ship. And therefore, oh, it's the World War One uh, World War One era sort of destroyer with four inch guns. Cute. USS Gearing versus HMS Victory. No torpedoes, who wins? And how long to win? Again, it's if they've got high explosive and they've got modern guns, they will sit out of range and blast them. It'll be a couple of shots, especially if they hit the powder. If it's HMS Victory with plus armor, as Daniel Freeman puts it, then it plot Victory wins. Just loads of star shells in the main guns and the Clemson class and set fire to Laurent. Well, I... I yeah, you could do that. I was trying to be nice and go for high explosive. At least that sounds better than saying you could blow them up with star shell. It's kind of cruel. It could be interesting. It could be. But no. It's a cool book. Of course, making the case for a navy... In the early 1900s. This book is making the case for a Navy in the 1930s, from memory. Published in 1940, so just, yeah. While World War II is going on, this is making the case for a Navy. And it is Modern Naval Strategy by Admiral Sir Reginald Bacon and F. E. McMurtry. Uh, Well, let's start off with, actually, I will read out this to you. I knew there was something. With that question, I was sort of going, I, I know there's something in the next book which is going to interest you. And you can't possibly read that as well as I can. But um, there is a comparison of Battleships table in this book on page 46. And it has the titles of name, date of launch, tonnage, length in feet, armament, 
design speed and cost. So there's HMS Victory here. Data launch. 1765 tonnage, 2,164 tons. Length in feet, 186. Armament, 100 muzzle loading cast iron guns. Design speed, sail. Cost, 100,000 pounds. Now, next one. Name, Alexandra. Eight in date of launch, 1875. Tonnage, 9,490 tons. Length and feet, 325. Armament, 818 ton, 422 ton muzzle loading guns. 14.3 knots. 514,000 pounds in cost. Then there's Camperdown, 1885. 10,600 tons, 330 feet long, 413 and a half inch, 67 ton, breech loading guns, 16.9 knots, 769,000 pounds. Lord Nelson, 1906, 16 and a half thousand tons, 14, uh, 410 feet long, 4 12 inch, that's 58 ton, 45 caliber guns, and 10 9.2 inch guns. 18 knots designed for speed, 1.6 million pounds. Dreadnought, 1906, 17,900 tons, 490 feet long, 10 12 inch, that's 58 ton, 45 caliber guns. 21 knots designed for speed, 1.8 million. And then finally, Nelson, 1925. 33,950 tons, 660 feet long, 9, 16 inch, 103 tons. 23 knots designed for speed, and 7.5 million. It will be seen that the tonnage of the ships rose only moderately between 1875 and 1906. Between 1906 and 1925, it practically doubled. The cost rose nearly five times. The caliber of principal guns increased from 12 to 16 inches. Lovely statement. There is one matter regarding battle fleets which is apt to be overlooked, namely, that if no other nation had any battleships, then a battle fleet would be useless to us. Battleships are primarily of importance to fight other battleships. If they were to vanish, then superiority to other class in other classes of ships would determine command of the sea. It may be asked, if this applies to battleships, why does it not apply to every, every class of ship? The answer is that, speaking generally, a battleship cannot be built in a hurry. Therefore, it is likely that any country could, during a war, spring a surprise on another by suddenly bringing a fresh battle fleet into being. Nor taking the, the, the many wartime preoccupations into account, is it likely the battleships be built during a war? If one country attempted to do so, its opponent could do, would do likewise. Little good would therefore ensure, so that the attempt is not likely to be made. The remark about battleships applies with equal force to all capital ships, but not to smaller ships, which could be built or more quickly built and built on the smaller types of slips, which therefore they could camouflage as merchant vessels. Therefore, so far as these are concerned, no risks can be run, and nations must build in peacetime to their war requirements. Arguments have been advanced in favour of building smaller battleships, say, too small for the cost of one large vessel. The reply is that tonnage is required to float the necessary vertical and horizontal armour and large engines are necessary to give the requisite speed. It must be remembered, also, that length of ship is important and speed is to be maintained when steaming in a steeway. One school of thought has consistently argued that it is foolish to build large battleships, as by doing so all the eggs are put in one basket. Let us see how large and small battleships compare in efficiency. It is not easy to make direct comparisons between the efficiency of ships which differ in displacement and which are also vary in other respects. Analysis, however, of the pocket battleship Admiral Shear and the Barham will bring out the salient features of the controversy. It's generally conceded that Admiral Shear is generally of a weaker type of construction than what is usually considered desirable in men of war. For starters, it's a heavy cruiser, not a battleship, but we'll leave that to one side. Length and the waterline. Admiral Shear, 609 feet. Barham, 634 and a half feet. Beam, maximum, 
69 and a half feet for Admiral Shear. Barham, 104 feet. Draft, mean. 21 and uh, two thirds feet for Admiral Shear. 30 and two thirds feet for Barham. Tonnage, 10,000 tons for Admiral Shear. 31,100 tons for Barham. Main armament, 6 of 11 inch guns. 8 of 15 inch guns for Barham. Secondary armament, 8 of 5.9 inch guns for Shear. 12 of 6 inch guns for Barham. Armor protection, belt, 4 inches for Shear. 13 inches for Barham. Turrets, 7 inches and 4 inches for Shear. 10 inches and 7 inches for Barham. Upper deck, 1.5 to 3 inches for Shear. 2 inches to 3 inches for Barham. Speed maximum, 26 knots for Admiral Shear. 24 knots for Barham. Horsepower, 54,000 shaft horsepower for Bar uh, for Shear. 75,000 shaft horsepower for Barham. Goes on to make the case that one Barham is equal to three shears. I'll spray uh, 28, your Iron Brew arrived. Congratulations. This is actually a good book. It's going to sound strange. What I, I, I disagree with so many things in this book. I can spend my day taking bits to pieces. But I would also urge it still to be read because... It has all sorts of things in it which explain the thinking in the 1920s and 1930s. You have to remember that Bacon and McCutry are not really on the cutting edge of things when they're writing this, but they are still two of the better informed people. So they do produce some very interesting ideas and some very interesting content. Avon Zasky, Reginald Bacon, the guy that was the first commander of the Dreadnought. Yep. John Emmett, maybe I'm just a little bit too, uh, just a little bit of a pyromaniac. I think we all are in some ways. My girlfriend gets worried every time we stay anywhere that has uh, that we need to light a fire for heat or something. I, I spend a lot of time tending that fire and making sure it's a good one. Dentrine tries to work out what the Washington Naval Treaty, London Naval Treaty, would classify a as cruiser as heavier than a treaty destroyer, so must be a cruiser. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to get into that one. Hello, Carl Gunner. Hello, to Belgium. Jeff Elam, the ironclad era were identifying guns by weight of mount and battleships the size of the treaty cruisers were the rule. Yep. Yeah. Lucy Jun, hello. This book sounds to be edging close to that infamous pronouncement about the US military eventually being able to afford one plane with the Air Force and the Navy gets three days uh, get three days in the Marine on Sundays. Uh, it's an interesting book to read. Um, Nintendo Switch and Animal Crossing, because we all need something happy these days. I don't have either. <laughs> mm hmm. If anyone else has a Nintendo Switch, please put them in the chat. Let's see. We need fire for our very comfortable lifestyle. Mm. <laughs> Shear is an armored commerce radar that can also handle Scandinavian coast battleships. I would honestly think if those Scandinavian coastal battleships were actually, I don't know, at alert and prepared to fire straight away, then she might not be able to handle them. <laughs> it's a good book, though. It is. It's a very good book. Mm. Ah. 
さあ、Next one, Thirteen Days. はい。Um, Rob, my work permits me to listen to audiobooks because I all day. Um, think you could、uh, do a round of cool naval history audiobooks or available on audio? Audible? I could do. I haven't yet. Con- I haven't really considered that. I haven't got a few Audible books. I have to think, look into it. I have to see whether Audible w- uh, whether I could、um, do some. See what the books are available are on Audible. I haven't done a full naval history search really on Audible. I have to see. <laughs> right, and let's put this into 46. Now, this is a particularly cool one, I have to admit, because it's the 13 days, the diplomacy and disaster, the countdown to the Great War. And it's a really interesting idea because it's literally what happened. We all know the myth and the idea of, you know, a very much forgotten, ju-、uh, a very much forgotten duke gets shot and we end up with World War I. Well, this shows it a little bit more. How about a Hain special from Carl and Gannon? I would probably, seeing as I'd want 15 Hain books, there are many options I can do once I've got all my books out of boxes and able in front of me to be organized properly, rather than. It's going to sound strange. What I currently have is quite a lot of my shelves are double stacked. With books in front of books, so two l a y e r deep. And I know what's behind them, but quite, you have to do clever things to get at them. And then I have about seven boxes of books, and then I have a whole load of books down there, and I have books up in the roof in more boxes, and I have piles of books. And so this is, again, this is another reason for getting this office once it's built properly. <laughs> Serbian cabinet agreed that it would be impolite, impolitic, to reject the ultimatum outright. Another possibility was to follow the line suggested by b e r h r o l in Paris and San g i l i a n o in Rome. Acceptance in principle. This would have been the most subtle response. It would have badly wrong footed Vienna, which was expecting rejection. If Serbia had accepted the ultimatum in principle, Vienna would have been forced to engage in a long process of negotiating over the details of its complex demands, which have given Serbia plenty of opportunities to argue and delay while diplomatic pressure was brought on Austria Hungary. It seems that Belgrade never considered this possibility. There were two reasons why it did not. First, it would have been interpreted as humiliating. Second, it would have enraged the extreme nationalists, endangered the survival of the government, probably personally.、Um, Which was still weak after the pivotal crisis of late June, and risked revealing the extent of the involvement of parts of the Serbian government in the Sarajevo conspiracy. p i a z i k was reluctant to make any concessions, as he admitted to the Bulgarian minister two days later if Serbia had been sure of being supported to such an extent by Russia, she would never have conceded so much. p i a z i k and the cabinet needed to get, decided to give the impression that they were accepting as much as possible the ultimatum while rejecting outright only point six, the participation of Austro Hungarian officials in the judicial inquiry. In this effort, they were remarkably successful. Most other European governments thought they had accepted all the other points. In fact, the drafting by Pazek and the Foreign Ministry was very clever and subtle. Caveats were included on nearly every point, which would have enabled the Serbs to avoid implementing many of the demands in the event of Austria Hungary accepting the reply. The full text of the Serbian reply is in Appendix B, and I think I will actually go to Appendix B and will read it out because it is worth reading. <laughs> Uh, 
The Royal Serbian Government has received the communication of the Imperial and Royal Government of the 23rd instant, and are convinced that their reply will, be, will remove any misunderstanding which may threaten to impair the good, impair the good relate, and neighbourly relations between the Austro Hungarian monarchy and the Kingdom of Serbia. Conscious of the fact that the protests which were made both from the Tribune of the National uh, Shibanskina and in the declarations and actions of the responsible representatives of the state. Protests which were cut short by the declarations made by the Serbian government on the 31st of March 1909 have not been renewed on any occasion as regards the great neighbouring monarchy, and that no attempt has been made since that time, either by the successive royal governments or by their organs, to change the political and legal state of affairs created in the Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the royal government draw attention to the fact that this, in this connection, the imperial and royal government have made no representations except one, one concerning a school book. On that occasion, the imperial and royal government received an entirely satisfactory explanation. Serbia has several times given proofs of her pacific and moderate policy during the Balkan crisis. And it is thanks to Serbia and to the sacrifice that should be made in exclusive interest of European peace that that peace has been preserved. The royal government cannot be held responsible for manifestations of a private character, such as articles in the press and, and the peaceable work of societies. Manifestations which take place in nearly all countries in the ordinary course of events, and which, as a general rule, escape official control. The royal government are all the less responsible in view of the fact that at the time of the solution of a series of questions which arose between Serbia and Austro-Hungary, they gave proof of a great narrowness to oblige, and thus succeeding in settling the majority of these questions to the advantage of the two neighbouring countries. For these reasons, the royal government have been pained and surprised at the statements, uh, except according to which members of the Kingdom of Serbia are supposed to have participated in preparations for crime committed in Sarajevo. The royal government expected to be invited to collaborate in an investigation of all that concerns this crime, and they were ready, in order to provide the entire correctness of their attitude, to take measures against any persons concerning whom representatives were made to them. Falling in, therefore, with the desire of the Imperial Royal Government, they are prepared to hand over for trial any Serbian subject, without regard to his situation or rank, of whose complicity in the crime of Sarajevo proofs are forthcoming, and more especially they undertake to cause to be published on the first page of the Journal Official on the date of 26th July the following declaration. The Royal Government of Serbia condemn all propaganda which may be directed against Austro-Hungary, that is to say, all such tendencies as aim at ultimately detaching from the Austro-Hungarian monarchy territories which form part thereof, and they sincerely de deplore the baneful consequences of these criminal mo movements. The royal government regret that, according to the communications from the Imperial Royal Government, certain Serbian officers and officials should have taken part in the above-mentioned propaganda, and thus compromised the good neighbourly relations to which the royal Serbian government was so uh, solemnly engaged by the declaration of the 31st of March 1909 which declaration disproves and repudiates all ideas or attempts at interference with the destiny of the, or destiny of the inhabitants of any part whatsoever of Austria-Hungary, and they consider it their duty formally to warn officers, officials, and the entire population of the kingdom that henceforth they will take the most rigorous steps against all such persons as are guilty of such acts to prevent and to repress, which they will use their utmost endeavour. Cool. It carries on, and it's a pretty skilly thing for another three pages. I'll read it. Or at least some of it. The declaration we brought to the knowledge of the Royal Army in an order of the day, in the name of His Majesty the King, by His Royal Highness the Crown Prince Alexander, and we published in the next official army bulletin. The Royal Government further undertake, one, to introduce at the first regular convection of the Swisnina, a provision into the press law providing for the most severe punishment for incitement to hatred or contempt of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, and for taking action against any publication, the general tendency of which is directed against the territorial integrity of Austro-Hungary. The government engaged at the approaching revision of the Constitution to cause an amendment to be introduced into Article 22 of the Constitution of such a nation that such publication may be confiscated, a proceeding at, pre a proceeding at present impossible under the categorical terms of Article 22 of the Constitution. Great. And let's see. Mm -hmm. Anos, you should voice for Audible, uh, uh, voice books for Audible. Hmm, it could be fun.
Dan Freeman, I can learn Haynes book. I do have the Haynes books. They're just in boxes. <laughs> I even have a Haynes book for all oh, for my first car, which I might add into the mix because I got the Haynes manual for my first car. I always get a Haynes manual when I buy when I buy a new when I get a car, which usually is second hand one. I always get a Haynes manual for it. Well. John Hargraves, have you read The Darkest Days? Yes, by Douglas Hewden. About the same subject as Clive Pointing. It's worth reading. It is. I sometimes jump between the two. But I got this out because this is, I think, is stronger on the Serbian side, and that's what I was using it for recently. I was looking up some history for a friend. Dan Freeman, Kendrick. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, it's hello, Stafford. <laughs> Have days gone smooth so far? It could do. It could do. I, I, I might be asking the Discord group for their collective help later tomorrow. Tomorrow, because I am trying to. I'm probably going to end up having a um, strongly worded discussion with the builder working on the uh, on the offices because. Okay, the way it's designed, it's supposed to have the outer wall, then it's supposed to have a breathable membrane, then it's supposed to have um, basically the wooden the wooden struts which go inside and the and the insulation, the battens and the insulation, and then it's supposed to have a layer of plastic. And then it's supposed to have the regly. <laughs> or I'm going to be smiling at, the, at you like this until you're going to do it. <sighs> Fun times. Don't know, are you trying to keep Dan Freeman at bay with the apple? <laughs> it might work. Um... I was asking. By the way, my wife just ordered me a new pile of books. U boats type. Uh, oh, type 10B. Oh, German submarine warfare, 1914, Battle of British battle cruisers, Italian cruisers, World War II, German pocket battleships, and some more. You have a lovely wife. You know, uh, she sounds like she's in the mold of my wonderful girlfriend who sends me iron brew. It's, it's very lucky when you when you find someone who will support you in your passions. <laughs> I hope I support her as well. All right, uh, Rick Vasa. I just read that Iron Brew was banned in Canada due to illegal hazards. Then Rebo, it's made to meet Canadian standards. <sighs> A slightly different formula, yeah. It's not quite the same in Canada. <laughs> Um. <laughs> Come on, don't buy a Kia Pancanto. Um, no, don't worry, you're safe from me from that. Um, I tend to go buy four by fours and big cars because I have to. Well, you've seen the fluffy research assistant. Um, he is a very big dog. Well, him and the book collection need to be moved around on occasion. It's you can't get away with just, you know, one going, mm -hmm, I've got space for you. He doesn't really appreciate it. <sighs> he will just complain. So it's kind of a case of to move him requires a big car. <laughs> Calm. My mum got mad I wanted a £45 book. Don't tell her about some of the books in my collection. I still remember the day my mum went, you're paying how much for a book? Oh, it's only £200. And she was going, that, 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 that's a lot of money. I went, yeah, it is, but it's not even the most expensive one I bought. <laughs> oh, that's a seriously expensive habit. Come on, after layer of plastic, there was a hiccup. Um, yeah, it's supposed to go out of all, breathable membrane. Battens and insulation, plastic, and then the inner wall. 
And in this is a good thing is if I can follow the instructions and I could build it, then I expect a professional builder to be able to do it. Uh, no, um, it, my backup is to call in Drac and him and me will build it together. I'll have to pay him in Chinese food. <laughs> I'm a takeaways. Oh. That's it. Uh, da, 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 da. Now, what was I going on the phone for? Oh, yes. Just been sent a message. Right. <sighs> Is that okay? Rob, uh, thank, God, uh, thank goodness my father, a notable historian in his own right, sorted out the majority of his 100,000 books, not joking, before his own timely death. Yeah. I'm working on a collection that size. I'm heading for I'm I'm trying to get to it. I'm not sure whether I will sort it all out, though, for anyone. Jermak, old hobbyist pro say, I pray that after my death, my family will not sell my stuff at the price I told them I paid for it. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Don't worry, Dan. Look, many, uh, I, th this is the trouble for them, actually. They heard the phrase historian, and they didn't realize historian trained by shipwright and amateur carpenter, uh, shipwright father and amateur carpenter father can read plans, um, and amateur carpenter uh, grandfather as well, and does know how to work with wood. And you guys were employed because there was a team of four of you, and you were supposed to build it quickly and correctly. So I didn't have to worry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Hello, Samuel. Those were the ones he had in the apartment. Those are the ones in the office. Two offices, not counting. Mm. Carmen, have you read Nicholas Moran, The Can Openers? Is, uh, is it good worth £40 or pound, £5? Pounds? It's a fairly decent book. Worth forty-five pounds in good condition. Well, if it was on eBay, I would probably bid about forty, with the expectation it could go up to fifty. Um, but if it's on Amazon in good condition for forty-five pounds, I'd say that's probably okay, as long as that includes postage. If they're if they're going to charge you fifteen or sixteen pounds postage, it's not worth that much. But you know. <laughs> And ebooks are a lot cheaper, as Dan Freeman's point out. Yeah, you, you, you can store a lot of books in a... A well-designed space can store a lot of books. It's the next one. And... Helpfully, the time is reset on my, on my thing. One, oh four, oh oh. Save. There we go. So this is edited by Thomas C. Horn. It is the possibly the best book about the Battle of Midway I have ever read, and I've read a lot of them. Uh, I'm currently doing a lot of research on the Battle of Dogga Bank, but that's something else. The Battle of Midway is one of those books. And I really, really enjoy. I got it sent to me for free. It was one of the first books I was ever sent to review. And when I saw it, I went, oh, great, another Midway book.
I'm going to see this and this is going to be formulaic. I'm basically going to go, it's going to go bang, 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 bang. We all know the formula of Midway. They basically turn it into a movie. It could be, it's, that, it's so regularly gone through, it's practically become its own meme. World War One. Battle of Dogger Bank. Dan Freeman. Anyone who regularly subscribes to the World of Warships channel might be starting to put one and two, one, and one together at this point. So, what I love about this book it is not a book by a single author. For every subject, it has found probably one of the, if not the best author in their fields. And it has been written in such a way that it really does work. What do I also really like about this book? The fact that there are chapters in here which they've gone and found, like uh, Flying into the Beehive by Admiral John S. Jimmy Fack. U.S. Navy retired from the Naval History Series journal articles of the U.S. Naval Institute. So they have got some stuff which has been done by academics, some stuff which has been done by servicemen, even when they've been long dead. They have found them, and they have got some stuff in here which is just really, really cool. And I cannot... They've even got Spruance uh, in proceeding... from his article in proceeding, Proceedings. They have got... Leighton, they've got, there are so many people in here who are the people who are actually making decisions, so it's a really good mix. So, 118. Is the page I'm looking for. There we go. Flying into a Beehive by Admiral John S. Jimmy Fack. U.S. Navy retired. Published in 2007. This book itself was published in... I got it the same year it was published. 2013. Six Grumman F four Air F A Wildcat fighters of Fighting Squadron Three VF three were the sole protection for the U.S. Yorktown's twelve torpedo planes and seventeen dive bombers that attacked the Japanese first carrier striking force early on the fourth of June, nineteen forty-two. Launching nearly two hours after their compatriots on board the U.S. Enterprise and USS Hornet, the F four Fs were led by then Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Fack. They were the only fighters to engage the Japanese over their ships that morning. The following account is adapted from Facts U.S. Naval History or Institute Oral History. Before leaving Pearl Harbor, I was given a very brief indication that we expected an attack. There was obviously a big battle coming up in the middle of the Pacific. That's about all I was told before I landed upon York Yorktown CV-5 on May the 30th. That night, the air group met in the wardroom where Commander Mur Arnold, the air officer, gave us a complete briefing on everything that they knew about the opposing Japanese force and their probable intentions. So we had a day or so to think about before we arrived in a position. After this briefing, it was obvious a very serious and crucial engagement coming up. If we could win this one, we might be able to stop the Japanese advance. Lieutenant Commander Maxwell Leslie, the commanding officer of the Yorktown's dive bomb squadron, it was going to lead VB-3 and part of VS-5, and Lieutenant Commander Lance, Lem Massey, commanding officer of Torpedo Squadron, BT-3, suggested that we have a conference. I talked a bit to Lem before that, and told him I thought the fighter escort should go with him instead of the, with the, up with the, up with the dive horns. He said, I think you ought to be, get up with the dive horns, because that's where the Sierras are going to be. That's where they were in the Coral Sea battle. We knew we weren't going to have enough fighters to send with each. I had a plan to take eight planes because I wanted two divisions. That was the basic tactical breakdown we developed. 
and I couldn't believe that anybody would try to break this up. If you're going to send any number of airplanes, it's got to be divisible by four, otherwise you've left two planes without wingmen. Mac Leslie said he thought that I should go with the torpedo bombers. I said, how about letting me decide? Because they were playing Alphonse and Gaston, trying to give the fighters to the other squadron. I decided that since in the Coral Sea battle, the torpedo bomb planes had gone in pretty much unopposed and done the work in sinking the ship, these ships, the Japanese would be more concerned about them. They were going to be very concerned about a torpedo attack, and they're going to try to knock it out. So we all agreed that I should go with VT-3. Basically, FAC decided what was happening. The torpedo planes were, our, were old fire traps. They were so slow, those old TBDs. One w would go about 80 knots. With the nose down, maybe 110 awkward, and had no self-sealing tanks. They needed protection more than anyone else, so that governed our decision. I don't know how many people slept well, uh, very well the night of the 3rd of June. I was very concerned about whether the torpedo planes could get in or not. I knew that if the Japanese were together in one formation and had a fighter combat air patrol from all their carri the carriers, we would have, uh, very likely be outnumbered. We were also quite concerned that the Zero could outperform us in every way. We felt we had one advantage in that we could shoot better and had better guns. But if you don't get a chance to shoot, better guns matter little. I was thinking about all this and which pilots I would take me. I didn't sleep much that night, but we were all pretty optimistic because we felt that we were going to get tactical surprise. We didn't think the Japanese knew they were, that we were anywhere near them. And thus, this was a great morale builder. When you think you're going to have one of the basic principles of warfare, surprise on your side. I was a little appalled that we were in two separate task forces, with the Yorktown the only carrier in one of them. Captain Elliot Buckmaster, commander in, uh, commanding the Yorktown, or Rear Admiral Jack Fletcher, tactical commander of all the carriers and commander of Task Force 17, I guess, made a decision the next morning, before we launched, that we would have only six fighters go. I didn't have time to work my way up to talk to either one about it, but I did go to Murr Arnold. I said I was appalled that the Yorktown was separated from the Enterprise, CV-6 and Hornet CV-8, but wasn't too worried because I thought they would stick close together, enough for mutual defensive support. He said, and another thing, you better bring your planes back because I think we're in for one hell of a fight. I held a last minute briefing and emphasized that I wanted a formation to stick together, that nobody was going to be a lone wolf because lone wolves don't live very long under the circumstances we were getting into. And that was the best way to survive and protect the torpedo planes. I had to quickly revise the formation that we were going to fly over the torpedo planes because six isn't divisible by four. I had Ensign Robert A.M. R.M. Dib as my wingman with Lieutenant Junior Grade Bernard Markham of VF-42 as my other section leader. And his wing was Ensign Edgar Bassett, also of VF-42. That left two. Machinist, machinist mate Tom Cheek and Ensign da Daniel Sheedy. So I decided that we would put them just the stern of the 12 torpedo planes, down at a slightly lower altitude than I would fly, 1,000 or 1,500 feet above the torpedo plane formation, which would be a formation in the shape of a triangle, a sort of V of Vs. That's the way they would fly up to the target until they had to split and make out to make, uh, spread out to make the torpedo attack. We had to do S-turns, so slow, to slow down, so that we wouldn't run away from the TBDs because they were so slow. We didn't want to be stalling along with no ability to manoeuvre in case something hit us before we anticipated it. We are flying our standard combat formation that I developed, with a section leader and only one wingman in a combat division of four planes, two two-plane sections. I was leading, Randib was right under my wing, and Mackham had Bassett on his wing. I made that standard before the war. I recommended, after I developed this weave business, that all the squadrons accept this as a standard fighting formation. I got a message back from the commander, Aircraft Battle Force, that since the two-plane section was such a radical change, he couldn't force all the squadrons to do it, but that I had the authority to do it in my squadron. Actually, by this time, the idea was catching on anyway. BF2 was doing it, and so were some of the others. They'd thrown away the third plane and were flying two-plane sections, but they had not adopted the weaving tactics. The Hornet was rather new in the Pacific. I hadn't seen her pilots, but I tried to circulate this around. Lieutenant Commander John, uh, James Flatley, the Executive Officer of the Yorktown's VF-42, Battle of Coral Sea, and I had discussed it, sometimes late into the night, and he helped me for a while. He said, I think the four-plane division is good, but I think we shouldn't all try the same thing. Why don't I try six planes in a formation, you try four, and we'll see which one makes it out best. Lady has sent two messages. 
a personal one that me say me saying the four plane division is the only thing that will work and i'm calling it the fact weave for your information six planes don't work the two extra ones get lost he sent an official message describing this and saying that they were convinced that it was the only way for our fighters to fight especially against superior enemy fighters It's a very, very good book. Mm. Let's see. Bum, bum. What time? Ooh. Okay, King's Rook, take care. I'm falling asleep with the keyboard. Night, night. Abzaski, enjoyed them as well, uh, especially the one on why Sher uh, Sherman is as it is. Hmm. I think you're probably talking about Haynes manuals, aren't we? Uh, all right. Oh, no, we're talking about videos. Whose videos are we talking about? Ah, video on Chieftain's channel. Chieftain, yeah. He does good books, uh, good videos. I like the one, I think he's mentioned actually, on Tank Destroyers. I'm not sure, I haven't managed to track down his video on the Archer. I would like to, re I would like to see what his opinion of the Archer was. He wasn't going to do a dra Dan Freeman, I like the comment in this week's video that he wasn't going to do a drac and make a three to four hour video. Well, you know. It's fun. <sighs> yeah. Robert, oh gosh, that reminds me. I usually only listen to Drydox while doing sports. Just finished 127. I've got to play catch up. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. To be fair, yeah, there are some things. It's 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 been a fun time recently. I have to admit, um, I've oh that reminds me, I've got to send the edited uh, and put the uh, post this week's edited build chump pump so it comes out on Wednesday. Um, but you're going to love it. It is a good one, and we are starting to get in contact with the people who have sent in submissions uh, who are going to be coming on a foot before February. Carl Gosser, refact me. I never found any evidence that German BF 110s ever developed similar formation tactics. Yeah, it takes a specific sort of threat and attention you're dealing with. The fact we've works against, well, in the nicest way, against zoom and boom fighters, which are going to try and use their speed and maneuverability to outmaneuver you, and you basically trap them in because the only way they can track you is to follow you. And while they're fixated on the target, you cut uh, this, uh, your uh, Cully comes around and goes boom, bye bye with its firepower. The one, uh, the one row doesn't really have that scenario, that scenario or advantage. The one row is facing off against, let's be honest, <sighs> Spitfires, Hurricanes, and Gladiators, and you don't really have that sort of scenario. Or in terms of Russia, the MiGs and Yaks are not really the type of aircraft you want to try and do that against. Race car maker. Bill Trump's too? I can't keep up with Dragon Doctor Clark. Oh, you. That, yeah. We work hard. We drink a lot of iron brew, but we work hard. And we keep trying to get Kate Jameson on the um, show because um, she also drinks iron brew. So, you know, she'd fit with us. But um, Jamie's worried that if he's got three people drinking iron brew sitting talking to him, he's going to. He's going to need to have the very, very special Australian glass of wine. Mmm. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Stafford. I'll look it up. Robo, how about taking a Lanta class in the British Flotilla for Battle Novix? To me, it sounds like a um, cruel form of fun. Yes, but if I was going to do that, if you're going to take anything into Narvik, you're going to take an Arafusa class, because let's be honest, you don't need the rate of fire provided by the Atlanta or a Dido, because the 4.7s on the Tribals and the other destroyers present is going to be enough of the rate of fire, so what do you need? Well, let's be honest, the 6-inch guns of an Arafusa can buy that maneuverability. Getting in close, that's going to blast a lot of problems right away. 
but there again you do have wall spite which goes a lot further up the fjord than the chart necessarily shows that's produced after World War II for the records. Um, James Mark Young, hello. The Jaguar didn't usually practice a bunch of deflection shooting. Uh, this is a key component of the fact we... Yep. <laughs> Kat Hummond. Uh, getting my girlfriend on the bullet pumps. Uh, we are going to be working on that, but at the moment she's got, she's very, very busy. Once she's through her very, very busy period, then we will try and see again. I can hear something coming. Is it big or little? It's little fluff. Hello, trainee fluffy research assistant. <laughs> I'm campaigning for squeaky balls. You're campaigning for squeaky balls. You're always campaigning for squeaky balls. Hello, balls everyone. Shoot um, boys. Squeaky boys and children. Hello, everyone. The assistant fluffy researcher has come up to say hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. hello. Everything for you is a chew toy, isn't it? Very, very sore He's currently teething. So you've come to say hello. I'm also an assistant surveyor. Now, this gentleman, this little fluffy thing, has actually been assisting this week because he was sitting with me while I was reading this book and prepping for the Great War, uh, for the Great uh, the Grand, uh, the Great White Fleet. So, you know, he's had to listen to this book, haven't you? You have, several times. Hello. Shall I let you go? Hello. You said hi to everyone, and you're now currently trying to take blood. Go on. Oh, let's see. Yes, that was Zebedee. <laughs> he is very interested in the model always. Right. Um, let's see. So, let's check out the timings because I want to try and get this right on this one. Right then, uh, 0122, let's, uh, let's call it. Not sure how we're doing on books. Two, four, five. Okay, we're a third of the way through on the books. Right then, yeah. James Young, when you were like, I hear something coming, I was concerned. Ah, uh, you have to remember, I have bat-like hearing. <laughs> Trainee assistant, fluffy research assistant. Yes, it's basically go it's probably actually taking iron brew from me. So, this is... This one's good. Very, very good. This one is also very good. In fact, my honest advice is you always, if you're going to buy these books, you buy them as a pair. Because Hendrix's Theodore Roosevelt's Name of Diplomacy and Roosevelt's book in his own words combine, give you a very, very good idea of not just what he was saying, but what he was doing. How he was turning his vision into practice. It's kind of interesting because... When you talk about naval, uh, when you talk about theorists and people who put forward an idea of naval strategy, they rarely get to build things. And the people who build things and have their theories but don't build them, very rarely write it down what uh, what their theory is. Roosevelt is one of the few examples, but you also have to remember that he's also very good at selling his ideas. But he always sells them with a vision, and what he necessarily does with them versus what he tells people he's going to do with them is a different thing. So that's why you have Hendrix to compare and contrast and see whether he always walks the walk or whether he talks to talk. The 
sir, uh, roll a bonus. Sad to say, my, his, the fluffy research assistant might scare my fleet of fluff. Five lovely bunnies, Queen Annie's Revenge, Rodney, Max Gr mm. Probably the little one would more than the big one. It's going to sound strange. The big fluffy research assistant, um, the fluffy research assistant, would probably uh, curl up and be used by the bunnies as some sort of obstacle or warm thing for them to lie on. Uh, the he's about three. The, the the assistant trainee, the trainee assistant, fluffy research assistant, is about. 14 weeks old, Fif maybe 15 weeks, sort of urging that. And he would be chasing them everywhere because he's at that age. <laughs> All right, so. Contemporary accounts demonstrate that Roosevelt was quick to recognize Germany as a peer, competitor, and threat. In recent actions in China, coupled with its uh, recent actions in China, coupled with its rapidly growing immigrant population in South America, and solidly Mahanian naval policy, suggested correctly, as historical documents will later point out, the possibility of a larger, more permanent German presence in the Western Hemisphere. While still Vice President, Roosevelt had written to Henry Cabot Lodge that Germany interpreted the United States' refusal to build up a large navy as a sign of weakness, and that in a few years, they'll be in a position to take some step in the West Indies or South America, which will make us either put up or shut up on the Monroe Doctrine. Austria, Italy, and Russia did not trouble his thoughts. Germany was his focus. What Roosevelt needed, and perhaps even desired, was an opportunity to pit his will and the armament of the United States against Germany to firmly establish America's position as a leading power in the international system. Theodore Roosevelt went to extraordinary lengths to inform the European powers of his interpretation of the Monroe Doctrine, both formally through conversations with the German Consul General and the Ambassador, and informally through back-channel con personal conversations with his many contacts on the European continent. He telegraphed his inten intention to deploy a credible combat force by several means, not least of which was naming Dewey the task commander of the task force. Roosevelt set a time limit of 10 days for the resolution of the crisis, and when his ultimatum was ignored, he heightened the sense of urgency by accelerating the timetable. Ultimately, it was his presence and the force of will that convinced Ambassador von Holbern of the seriousness of the situation that led the ambassador to overcome the Kaiser's personal resistance to arbitration. Roosevelt's discretion, employed throughout the process, enabled his strategy to succeed. Had the president gone public with his demands at any time, the Kaiser, facing war or public humiliation, might well have chosen war. Yet the discreet nature of Roosevelt's demands allowed Wilhelm the opportunity to back down in private and preserved, for the immediate present, the future relations between the two nations. The previous century of tacit cooperation with Great Britain suggested that the British would neither actively oppose Roosevelt's new interpretation of the doctrine, nor stand in the way of his new activist foreign policy. Nevertheless, the events in Venezuela, along with the events of the last decade of the 19th century, suggest that conflict in the United States was not outside the realm of possibility. Documents recently declassified under the 100-year rule and the British National Archives suggest that Roosevelt's actions in regards to Venezuela may have had another, albeit unintended, result. As the winter exercise ex approached and tensions increased between the United States and European powers, the British Colonial Office drafted a secret memorandum that was forwarded to the Colonial Defence Committee, the War Office, and ultimately the Admiralty for comment. The memorandum raised questions about the defensibility of British possessions in the Western Atlantic in the event of conflict with the United States. In a response entitled Strategic Conditions in Events of War with the United States, the Admiralty expressed doubt that it would be possible to dispatch a sufficient naval force to maintain sea supremacy in the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean if at the time of the outbreak of war, uncertain or hostile relations existed between this country and a European power, i.e. to war problem. The document goes on to state that the United States would be in a position to stop our supplies from Canada and to secure all food implants, uh, imports from the United States itself, effectively cutting off two-thirds of Great Britain's food supply. The inescapable conclusion was that current realities emphasise the necessity of preserving good relations with the United States. Within two years, Lansdown and Balfour would secure an unofficial security arrangement with the United States, the beginning of the what has become known to uh, come to be known as a special relationship. As thus it was that Theodore Roosevelt established for all the world to see the two pillars on which he would construct his foreign policy, Mon Doctr Monroe Doctrine and the US Navy. 
His actions during the Venezuela, uh, Venezuela crisis established precedents for American involvement in the world throughout the 20th century. Yet for all his speak softly discretion, he could be driven to big stick audaciousness as well, as his next excursion in statecraft would amply illustrate. And this is chapters entitled Scalable Response in Defense of the Panamanian Revolution. I took the isthmus, started the canal, and then left Congress. Not to debate the canal, but to debate me. And while the debate goes on, so does the canal. Theodore Roosevelt, 23rd of March, 1911. 17 August, 1903. Theodore Roosevelt was furious. The Senate of Colombia had, to his surprise, rejected the carefully crafted Hay Herrain. Tehran Treaty, by which the United States would be granted permanent access to a narrow strip of land across the Colombian province of Panama. Negotiated at the behest of the Colombians in January of that year, with the terms very favorable to the United States, the treaty had been presented to the U.S. Senate, which ratified it in March. Momentum of the negotiations then passed the Colombians, who decided to take advantage of the United States' desire for a canal cutting across the narrow isthmus. As an, affir an affirmative vote by the Colombians would have authorized the construction to begin on one of the greatest engineering feats in history. The creation of the canal would enhance commerce, enable the quick transfer of U.S. Navy ships from one coast to the other, doubling the effectiveness of the American fleet. The canal had long occupied the center of Theodore Roosevelt's foreign policy, and he was determined to see it built. Roosevelt and the Panama Canal are forever linked in history. His conviction that a canal must be constructed through Central America had been a common theme in his writings and speeches throughout the 1890s. His personal interest in the building canal compelled him to be the first chief executive of the United States to travel outside the country. One office, when he boarded the USS Louisiana to travel to Canal Zone. But was the canal so important that Roosevelt would take the Isthmus of Panama in order to see it built? More specifically, would he risk military action to achieve his goal? Most historians agree that the Panamanian Revolution had its origins within Panama's borders and at and begin at the moment of the revolutionary's own choosing. Regardless of the US Navy's actions after the uprising began, no evidence has been ever been brought forward to confirm that Theodore Roosevelt explicitly promised assistance to the rebels. Instead, it's understood that the revolt was their decision to make, and that Roosevelt preserved his prerogative to respond to their actions in accordance with the interests of the United States as he saw them. Critical questions still remain, however. What did trigger Panama's movement towards independence? Was there a tipping point that initiated the fateful process of political independence from Colombia? And most importantly, was the revolt a popular uprising or the product of a small cabal of intelligentsia and business concerns? I. Was it really United Fruit? Was it United Fruit? Who knows? So. My hand productions. Hey, I, uh, I missed uh, a bit miffed. I missed 13 days. I have to go back there. Hold on. Oh, don't worry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a rigorous review of the operational military records reveals other events that, that contributed to the onset of the revolution. Specifically, the actions of two young UN U.S. Army officers acting behind the scenes in Colombia and Panama, and the appearance of a U.S. Navy warship off the coast of the Colombian province. Additionally, Close scrutiny of the Navy Department correspondence reveals a plan created the specific direction of the presence of the President of the United States. This plan, referred to as War Portfolio No. 1, envisioned an active defense of the new Panama, uh, Panamanian Republic by military units of the United States. Little known and never referenced by previous Roosevelt biographers, War Portfolio No. 1 demonstrates a decisiveness and predilection for action that stands in stark contrast to the mere foreign policy statements issued by the first Roosevelt administration. Policy statements that may have convinced the Colombians they could pull the tail of the tiger during the months of the negotiation that led up to the rejection of the Hay Herrain Treaty. <coughs> Dan Freeman, don't mess with Big Fruit or Big Fruit will mess with you. Yep. Jack Rabbits in Bogota. The arrival of the ratified Canal Treatment Treaty in the Can Colombian capital relieved the pressure on President Jose Marocan. Previously, he worried about numerous interests within the United States that were actively lobbying for a canal route across Nicaragua. But with the ball now safely back in his court, it was within the Colombian leader's power to confirm the treaty outright, given the dictatorial character of his office. Instead, he chose to call the nation's legislature into session. 
for the first time since 1898 to consider the treaty. Elections were held in May, but the Colombian Congress did not convene until the 20th of June. The US government did not anticipate problems, despite growing popular sentiment against certain aspects of the treaty that infringed on Colombian sovereignty. An American official in Bogota reported on the 20th of June that friends of government had control in Congress. I believe any legislation seriously desired by government will pass. In the case of the resistance emerged soon after the Congress convened. Americans travelling to Colombia in the days before new Congress opened were surprised to be joined by Colombian expatriates returning from Europe and elsewhere. The Colombians were amazingly frank about their intentions. They hoped to gain a seat in the Colombian Senate, but they planned to sit with open pockets awaiting American bribes to buy their votes. An agent of the Kaiser was supposedly also in Bogota, actively working behind the scenes to defeat the treaty in hopes that Germany might gain the Canal franchise. On 26 June, the American embassy in Bogota, Arthur M. Bilpot, a law lawyer from Illinois, appointed Minister of Colombia on the basis of his loyalty to the Republican Party, reported that while the treaty's passage in the Colombian lower house seemed assured, unfriendly influence makes the majority in the Senate uncertain. Two weeks later, Burpre admitted to the Secretary of State Hay that one of the Secretary's encrypted telegrams had reached certain members of the Senate. Among other things, the telegram stated, if Colombia should now reject the treaty or unduly delay its ratification, the friendly understanding between the two countries would be so seriously compromised that action might be taken by Congress next winter, with every, which every friend of Colombia would regret. Bopre had presented the substance of this telegram to the Foreign Minister of Colombia a few days later. Two weeks after that, shortly after the Colombian Congress convened, President Maracan met with the members of the nation's Senate at the President's Palace and leaked the contents of the private communication between the American Secretary of State and the Colombian Foreign Minister. The disclosure, in Verapé's words, created sensation. Bupre soon notified Washington that the leak was part of a deliberate strategy employed by President Marikin. The motivation of the Colombian government became clear two weeks later, when Bupre communicated two suggested amendments that would remove any further delay in ratification. The first amendment required the French-owned Panama Canal Company to pay Colombia $10 million of the $40 million the company was scheduled to receive from the United States as compensation for the canal concession. The second amendment Increase the United States direct com uh, payment to Colombia from $10 million to $15 million. Jose Marroquin and his cronies were scheming for more money. As mentioned earlier, some members of the new Colombian Senate had sent, spent a number of years abroad in Europe. One such member who had lived in Germany asked the German charge of affairs if the German government would like to enter the bidding for the canal concession. Britain's diplomatic representative in Bogota received a similar inquiry. The Colombian senators saw a potential windfall in the canal and were certain that the United States would soon see the light and agree to their terms. The halls of the Colombian Senate echoed with conversation and debate about protecting the ultimate sovereignty of Colombia over the canal zone. Popular sentiments meant to gain the support of the Colombian people, who had been swayed by the words of their leaders and now fully opposed the treaty. But Prey made it clear to his superiors in Washington that ratification could be achieved if the United States would offer more money. Secretary Hay responded in a wire sent on 20th of July, This government has no right or competence to covenant with Colombia to impose new financial obligation upon the canal company, and the President would not submit to our Senate any amendment in that sense. The present treaty already represented significant compromises on the part of the United States, and Roosevelt was unwilling to concede more. The original language had asked for a lease in perpetuity, for example, and the Colombians had counted with a fixed term of 100 years. This was acceptable. The United States had asked for a canal zone 10 miles wide. The Colombians had suggested 10 kilometers. This too was acceptable. Roosevelt's emissary had offered a payment of $7 million, but the Colombians had demurred until the price was raised to $10 million. The Americans had bargained in good faith at every stage of the original negotiation prior to the US Senate's ratification vote and had already met each of the Colombia's demands. When word re on arrived on the evening of 12 August that the Colombian Senate had rejected the treaty, Roosevelt raged that the jackrabbits in Bogota must not be allowed to unilaterally bar one of the future highways of civilization. Something had to be done to remove the bar. Dan Freeman, I want a Marine Corps and diplomatic service. How do I go about buying one? Um, change your name to Big Fruit. Apparently, according to Trent Tadanka. <laughs> it was true at that time. Uh, mm. General Smedley Butler wrote a lot about Big Fruit. They were powerful at the time. <laughs> hmm. Right. 
I'll be back in a second. E ela tá tão fim. Para, para. Uh! Alô, e aqui Right then. Uh... <laughs> mm -hmm. So, it's a good book. And, as I said, the two combined, great combination. A great combination. And a fun one to read. Um, Eric Kaplan, so are you sticking to Teddy R today, or is Falcon Simon's question acceptable? It's brew ships. All questions are acceptable, and we're going through a whole list of random books. We've just done a fair amount of Teddy R because, well, there's been a lot about him recently on the channel. And you might have noticed it's been sort of... It's one of the things is I've started noticing that, um... Without any planning of it at all, but our, our, our talking and sharing topics and discussing things in Bilge Pump so regularly as we do between the three of us does mean that I've started to notice that the sort of patterns are if one of us is doing something in our channel, then similar topics will start to crop up in the other two channels. And it's sort of this sort of feeding going on here, a, a sort of a, a group sort of uh, think sort of developing between Bilge Pumps. It's quite fun. So. Next book, while you're thinking about questions to ask, Britain's Naval Future by James Cable. It's a cool one. It's published in 1983. Has a whole section about the Falklands War, rather appropriate for the question which is just coming up. And has a whole chapter entitled The Relevance of Sea Power. And I'm going to be getting into that in a second now. The Relevance of Sea Power. What is the objective in naval warfare if command of the sea cannot be achieved? By Rosin uh, is a quote from Rosinski. Before attempting to examine the prospective utility to Britain of the Royal Navy, it seems desirable to consider briefly the general relevance of sea power in a world that has undergone profound changes. Political as well as technology, in the 36 years, the longest period in modern history that have elapsed since two fleets last met in naval battle. In doing so, one temptation must regretfully be set aside. Space is lacking to discuss the argument. Skillfully deployed in Chapter 7 of Paul Kennedy's admirable and often quoted Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery, that a secular and adverse change has occurred in the relationship between sea power and land power. Two exercises, excuses, may be advanced. First, Kennedy's argument is directed more to the British dilemma, which will be considered later, than to the general principle in questioning it. Secondly, 
As the legendary Chinese said of the French Revolution, it is perhaps too soon to judge. What is 36 years? As long as the two superpowers continue to spend more than ever before on their navies, the concept of sea power must still deserve some thought on its maritime merits. Sea power has very frequently and, very and variously described, but Roskill's definition is concise. The function of maritime power is to win and keep control of the sea for one's own use, and to deny such control to one's adversaries. Here, control is employed as the equivalent of the older command of the sea, which, so Corbett declared, means nothing but the control of maritime communications. In modern American usage, however, sea control is often contrasted as a separate naval mission, with the projective of naval, projection of naval power ashore. This is, this is, if not a distinction without a difference, perhaps a juxtaposition of the whole within, with one of its parts. As Admiral, Admiral Holloway pointed out, when Chief of Naval Operations in the United States, sea control is a prerequisite of all other naval tasks and most sustained operations by the general purpose forces of other services. It thus seems preferable, at least at the outset of the argument, to follow Roskill in treating control as a condition for using the sea. This is a classical conception, primarily applicable to war and to nations aspiring to naval superiority, but capable of extension for other purposes. The process has to start with the reminder that, even in the light of historical experience and without considering the impact of recent developments, neither control nor its denial can reasonably be expected to prove complete, permanent or universal. It has often happened, whether in the 17th century or for much of the Second World War, that control has remained in dispute. Even when one fleet has established a clear ascendancy, this has often not been extended to all uses of the sea. In the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, when British sea control reached its zenith, the depredations of the enemy commerce raiders were always substantial, even if convoy made them tolerable. In the First World War, the U-boat campaign undermined British naval strategy and threatened actual defeat. The time taken by the US Navy to establish control of the Pacific during the Second World War was enough to permit the emergence of fundamental and lasting political changes in most of the lim limitrof uh, countries. The, eruption, uh, the interruption of control, even for brief periods, has been often been critical. In 1940, 48 hours of aberration by the Royal Navy sealed the fate of Norway. Finally, there are usually, uh, usually some seas, the Baltic and both World Wars, in which the strongest navy does not even attempt to win control. These inevitable imperfections of sea control are often aggravated by mere human error. Admiral Nagumo and Midway, for instance, nevertheless, they do not invalidate the concept. They illustrate the difficulty of its application. This has to be depended on the resources available, the nature of the conflict and the priority attaching to the particular uses of the sea, which it is intended either to protect or to deny. It is the first of these factors which has received most attention, and traditional theory assume that sea control and ultimate victory could be expected to reward the stronger navy. Even the experience of two world wars is often interpreted in terms of British failure to provide material the right kind in sufficient quantity. Undoubtedly, the lack of secure bases in both wars, the deficiency of naval construction and armament, and the utterly inadequate provisions for defence against mines, those pathetic sweepers in the Dardanelles, submarines or aircraft, can be attributed both to technical blunders and to resource constraints. But the disappointing results of attempts at sea control or denial, together with some of the deficiencies in material, had a more fundamental cause in prior misconceptions of the nature of the coming conflict and of the strategy required to meet it. Before the First World War, for instance, neither the British nor the German Navy could seriously complain that their demands had been denied by their respective politicians. But the Germans had provoked the British into war by building a battle fleet for which they could, in the event, devise no strategic role. Its deterrent functions was not merely a political failure, but a boomerang. When war came, the close blockade it was intended to break once attrition had reduced the spirit of the British fleet, did not materialise. The distant blockade remained beyond German reach and was ultimately effective, yet the British neither foresaw the German counter, which might have been much more devastating without the wasted expenditure on the high seas fleet, of a submarine war on trade, nor, until the 11th hour, reacted to the adoption, uh, adopting the classical expedient of convoy and escort. Two fortuitous events transformed for, Brit uh, transformed for Britain the character of the Second World War and obscured the extent to which strategic misconceptions were responsible for British unreadiness for any kind of conflict in 1939. The German invasion of the Soviet Union 
and the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor provided Britain with allies more powerful than herself and created conditions in which the British Army and, more dubiously, Bomber Command could make an important contribution to the defeat of Germany. The initial continental commitment and the bombing offensive seemed retrospectively, it was nearly posthumously, justified. Yet neither the expeditionary force nor the long-range bombers came near to achieving the original objectives of deterring Germany from war and preventing her conquest of Europe. The continent was lost and with it substantial British forces. What is more, the diversion before the during the war of resources to these two unproductive tasks left too little to provide sufficient ships and aircraft of the right kind to ensure the defence of British Isles and their seaborne communications. If Britain was neither invaded in 1940 nor starved in subsequent years, it was in spite of British strategy, not because of it. It would be unconvincing to explore the hypothetical consequences of the adoption in the early 30s of the maritime strategy intended to ensure the defence of Britain, even to keep her state in a state of peace, until such a time as a change in the international situation offered a real prospect, which did not exist in 1939, of actually defeating Germany. This alternative strategy of ensuring Britain against a British defeat was rejected in favour of gambling on the chance of deterrence and ultimate victory. Fortune favoured the reckless decision, and it can never be proved that the two options were mutually exclusive, or that the first offered rather better prospects than the second. The possibility, nevertheless, deserves to be remembered, as does the subordinate role actually allotted to the British sea power by anyone attempted to invoke past precedent as a guide to future choice. Naturally, the governing factor will again be the political objective, which has to determine the general strategy and the priority allotted with that strategy to seek control or sea denial. There is nothing eternal or immutable about British strategic objectives, and even, for an island state, these two expedients do not have the same value in every conflict. Nor are they necessarily exercised for the same purpose. It is the nature of conflict which decides the nature and relative importance of using the sea in oneself or denying it to adversaries, or distant waters, or the narrow seas, of the immediate outcome or an ultimate decision. In 1588, in 1688, and in 1940, what matter was to deny the use of the channel to an enemy invasion? Failure was irredeemable. On the other hand, German control of the channel for the return of their warships from Brest in February 1942 merely humiliated the British without affecting the outcome of the war. This discrimination between the use of those uses of sea, whether by oneself or the enemy, which can be decisive and those which are not, is inadequately reflected in traditional theory. This tended to follow Mahan in regarding command of sea as in itself as objective objective and one to be attained by the possession of that overbearing power of the sea which drives the enemy's flag from it or allows it to appear only as a fugitive. Corbett, for instance, argued that a plan of war which has the destruction of trade for its primacy, a primary objective implies in the party using it in, uh, using it in inferiority at sea. <coughs> and his superiority, his objective would be to convert that superiority to a working command by battle or blockade. This is an interesting example of putting the cart before the horse, destruction of trade being rejected, not on its merits or as a form of seek and denial, but as an instrument to an, of an inferior. The word has moral overtones. Navy. Admittedly, Corbett did not believe that war on trade would be effective. No power will incur the odium of sinking a ship with all hands, against moral, ju moral judgment, but only Fisher dissented, and British naval strategy in the First World War did aim at wor working command by battle or blockade, without realising, until it was almost too late, that the imperfections of command would critically affect the outcome of the war. James Cable, Britain's Naval Future. Published 1983. All right, it's a good book, and I'll see if there's any questions coming through on it, but while doing that, I will answer Eric Kaufman's question on the Falklands War. Okay, so Simon Whistler on YouTube Friday mentioned that the Black, uh, Black Buck raids were not worth it. I say that Black Buck 1 single-handedly might have won the war, or at least with the relevant, uh, relative ease they won it. Uh, the one, one bomb hit that knocked out the runway, I say the Argentine out, cut off their spare, uh, supplies and possibility of reinforcement, demoralizing them. And also said to Buenos, uh, uh, to Buenos that we can, uh, Buenos Aires, we can touch you, and thus sent their f uh, funding, military uh, feuding military branches in further disarray. Your thoughts? Well, I agree with you on the latter, that actually carrying out the bombing raid did have an impact and did force the enemy to relocate fighters. Seeing as they were still bringing in Hercules and other aircraft by night, I don't think it really stopped off the air bridge. I don't think they were ever in a position really at the time once uh, the blockade started to extend the runway to be able to support fighters, so that wasn't a problem. And I, 
uh, from all the, com the discussions I've seen over the years, I'm not convinced that the runway was in any way significantly damaged by the bomb. I think as a moral and psychological operation, it was absolutely successful. I think as a military sort of operation, it was not. But I also think it was very useful in terms of what it achieved, in terms of, as you say, diverting fighter strength north. So that's what I would go for. Uh, Daniel Freeman, a single bomb hit on a runway should take a uh, should take a competent military air base a full 30 to 40 minutes, five minutes to fix, depending on whether they interrupt the meal they are eating when it hits. Uh, a little bit longer, but yeah, you got, you're sort of not so far away. Dylan uh, Lefer, hello, I don't think I've seen you before. Lefer, um, didn't they get the runway repaired within a day and had large aircraft landing next? They either didn't get hit or they got it very rapidly repaired. They certainly had Hercules coming in and out that night. Um, they weren't using scatterable mines. Nighthound Productions. Given the RN's Thatcher government reduction of the RN naval vessels in the wake of the Falklands, what would you view as a good or potentially good decision to be maintained expanded? Uh, and what would you say to uh, do away with and so favor of what? I hope the question makes sense. Uh, honestly, what the Thatcher starts getting rid of is the Deadwood, in some respects. Uh, they very quickly find out that they need to recapitalize the fleet, that a lot of ships have been landed. Uh, I will often bring up the Leander-class frigates as being a great example in their time of producing a mass-produced vessel. But they shouldn't have been being, uh, being used as they were in the Falklands War. They weren't designed for that. They didn't have the capabilities for that. And there's a reason the Type 23s come about and the Type 22s get increased in numbers. I would have liked a Type 43 to come into service after the Falklands War, but it doesn't. It's The Type 42s um, uh, are sort of longer ones I put in. And the Falklands is an interesting war in that you have a lot of cuts. It's not just... We often talk about Thatcher's government, but every government had been cutting the Royal Navy since a <sighs> since Eden. From Eden onwards, they're non they're cutting the navy. Why? Because they're prioritizing the Central Front, which makes sense in the strategic paradigm you have of the Cold War, where everything's focused on the Central Front. But uh, I think it's in. I'm not sure in which of Michael Clapp's um, sings in bilge pumps it is, whether it's in the special edition or it's in the others, he makes the point that when he was trying to organize a convoy practice, he was told war was going to be over in a couple of days, so there was no point doing a convoy because it would never reach anywhere. There was no point practicing it. It would never happen. And you have to remember, in the Cold War period, everyone was so focused on fighting a nuclear war, they forgot other wars might happen. And I have a fear that's why you end up with the Falklands. Everyone's so focused on the number one threat, they forgot the number two threat, number three threat, number four threat, and number five threat actually exist. And you always have to be so careful of that. And as Night Hand Reproduction also goes on, is you have to bear in mind that Hercules Super 30 are very capable of operating off rough airstrips. They are. Then Lefer, I was here during the ferry stream. Haven't been able to join many uh, streams due to uni, uh, uni. Lego biplane on your Discord is me. Well, cool. You're the Lego biplane. I haven't I haven't responded to any of the comments, but you have done some really cool ones. So thank you. Thank you for being on Discord. Jeffina, what do you think of the stretch twenty twos? Uh, Broadbeam twenty twos are cool. I have. You won't realize this, but. Actually, that picture there is a whole load of Type 22s, and it's one of the ones my dad worked on, and there's Type 23s so there's more of that, that are above my bed, which are ones my dad worked on. And so I... Uh, my dad would always tell you the biggest missed opportunity for Britain after uh, in this period was not... Um, was not... The CVA one, although he would have loved that, he felt the Invincible class were fairly good. He would have liked to have stood and stretched the Invincible class, which was going to be an extra 
20 meters longer, 20, uh, was it 20 or 25 meters, 25 meters longer, I think, uh, roughly. And so would have had a lot more space and was going to have a deck edge lifts rather than center line lifts. And so that would have been a far more useful sort of thing, but it would have been obviously a carrier rather than a through deck cruiser. He also would have liked, he, he was always arguing that the Bristol should have been kept being built with a hybrid sea dart seawall system rather than building type 42s and were especially necessary after the cva1 was cancelled it would have been an interesting scenario to have That sounded a lot like two power standard. Bad idea then, and back uh, ba uh, then, and still today. Oh, it always is. Uh, wind corrected munitions dispenser with scattable mines toss bomb. Uh, bomb is how it's done. Uh, after the S four hundreds are pushed back. Ah, uh, yes, that's how we do it modernly. But uh, remember, this was done with iron crater bombs uh, from a Vulcan bomber. And by the way, um, I have to admit. Vulcan bombers are the way to a girl's heart. I am lucky enough to be with one who, basically, if I can guarantee the museum has a good Vulcan bomber, I know she will be happy. I also know that I will, you know, have to spend there yeah, that um, she will spend a good the amount of time wandering around it, going, "It's beautiful," and I'll be going because it is, and she is as well. Anyway. That's Britain's Naval Future by James Cable. I don't mention him often enough. I need to mention him more because he really is good. I The, the world gets focused very much on Corbett and Mahan, and I try and introduce the world as much as I can to other theorists, and there are other ones, and Cable is amongst the best. And in fact, I would argue is the best. His gunboat diplomacy is really, really good. I'm not sure where it is at the moment. It's a little black book, and I have it somewhere around me. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. I was reading it earlier. Um, yeah, there it is. Come back to diplomacy. Um, but Naval Future, also good. And the thing is, because he's not as well known as Corbett or Mahan, often his books are quite cheap. <sighs> Give me time, Juno 111. Give me time. My plan is to try and get at least a permanent job first. Joys of Academia. Contract work. So, good books. <laughs> Captain Seawolf, your father's idea of an SD, uh, S, uh, C Dart uh, Seawolf Bristol sounds like a Type 64 combo in one hole. Actually, they worked it up it was going to be a modification. They were going to build more Bristols based on it. And then they were build, decided to build the Type 42s. And he just went... He, he, he found them all mm, annoying. He, he, he had fun sometimes with the politicians. Um, Dr. Clark, how much of a threat were the Argentine cameras during the conflict? I know they were involved, but I don't hear much on them. They didn't really do much. They were very good for reconnaissance, not really involved doing much else. Dan Freeman, what kind of crazy idea is this? To, is it to put decent functional weapon systems that complement each other together on the same warship and get it in decent numbers? I know, it's, it, it's so absurd. But he thought it would be a great force multiplier for the carriers because he thought if you have the Invincible class carriers and they each had a couple of Ds with them, and they, of course, had their own CDAR launchers, then combine, that would be a very effective operational force, and then it would free up the frigates to do the anti-submarine warfare role more. <clears throat> Run.
Ooh. Good Lord, I'm not sure if I'll get through all these tonight if I keep doing 20 minutes a book, but we're discussing them, so that's good. And the other books will just be done another time. So, landing a salt craft. By Brian Lavery. And... It's a good book. That's a good one. Published 2009. It has lovely pictures in it. It has organizational charts in it. It has operational charts in it. It has designs of the ships which carry them in it. It has the designs of them in it. It is a very, very good book. If you're feeling like modeling landing craft, this is certainly the book to have. Layout and build. The hull. Seen in profile out of the water, the assaulting landing craft had just the hint of the attractive lines that might be expected from a yacht builder such as Fornicroft. The deck had a very slight upward curve or shear to help the bow and meet the waves more effectively. The lower bow had a much steeper curve in what was officially known as the Sampan style, perhaps based on Morn's experience in the Far East. It was intended to allow the craft to beach gently, whatever the angle of the shore. From above, the ALC also also had surprisingly attractive curves as the hull narrowed, out to, narrowed towards the bow, which of course was completely flat because of the need to, to fit a ramp. From any other aspect, the ALC was undoubtedly angler, although not entirely box-like. Boat builders called this chine construction, with very definite corners in the form of the hull. It was an extreme example of a shape common in fast power boats, of a type built by Fornicroft and other yards. Its bottom was not completely flat and was angled slightly upwards on each side. This allowed it to hit the water more gently than pit when pitching. Fore and aft wooden battens, known as barbels, were fitted under the hull to make the vessel lie level if it was aground. The sides of the boat were not vertical, but angled slightly outward helping create a, 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 right, a writing motion if the vessel heeled to one side or the other. The transom that formed the stern, however, was completely flat and vertical. The shape of the bow was dominated by the ramp, angled forward at about 45 degrees when in the stow position at sea. It's about four foot, uh, feet six inches wide, so that two lines of men could get out simultaneously, and it was raised and lowered by means of a system of pulleys inside the hull. It had a small rollers on its outer end to help when getting off the beach. Internally, the space behind, behind the ramp was raised above the level of the troop deck and shut off from it uh, at sea by armoured doors. In earlier models, the space on either side was filled with buoyant material known as onazut. Behind the doors was a troop compartment, which took up more than half of the length of the vessel. The men sat on three rows of four and a half seats. The men of the middle row were exposed unless canvas awnings were fitted. Those on the outside could get, find some shelter under the decks. Forward in this area, the coxswain steering shelter was fitted on the starboard side, except in the very early models, or those adapted for special purposes. In that position, it did not interrupt across the troop accommodation, but it gave the coxswain a good view while keeping him on a lowdown. The steering position was armoured against small arms fire, with slots one and three quarter inches wide that would be kept, could be kept opened or closed. The coxswain had a folding seat 15 inches above the deck, so he had a choice of positions. He could open the armoured doors on the roof to stand up and get a better view, or he could sit down, close the doors and get the benefit of armour if the enemy fire was intense. The coxswain had a car-type steering wheel and telegraphs were sending orders to the engine room because he did not operate the engine speeds directly. He had two gear levers, one for each gear, and a voice pipe to communicate with Stoker. Selected vessels, can to be used by flotility as navigators, had armour made in non-magnetic alloys so that they would not have caused deviation on the compass. Later models had radios fitted just forward of the steering position. On the port side, 
Opposite the steering compartment was an armoured position for a Lewis gun and later a Bren gun. This had full height armour forward, with its side panels sloping downwards to allow the gun to be used for anti-aircraft fire. The frontal armour of this compartment, the steering compartment, and the bow doors formed a continuous line against enemy fire. The deck of the troop compartment was almost mostly flat, except where it rose towards the bows to take them into the armoured doors. The interior of the troop compartment was featureless except for the three benches, which were eight inches high and might be made with boards or slats. The central bench could be removed if stores had to be carried inside instead of men. At the after end of the troop compartments was a watertight bulkhead that sealed off the engine room with a small hatch for access by the stoker. Above this, after the after deck of the craft moved, uh, covered the entire width of the engines. A small breakwater kind of protected the crew and the troops from waves that might break astern. Just forward of that, easily accessible from the troop deck, was the anchor windlass. A small stroller on top of this allowed the anchor cable to run free, and there was a double roller fair, uh, fair, lead, uh, fair lead on the screen. It's a cool book, and it's a very good book. Okay. Mm -hmm. U.S. did not sign that treaty. Um, I never did. Jeff Hiller, what's working on the last full landing in the West? Last full up landing in the West. There are a fair number of river crossings where various uh, interesting craft get used. So it's last mm, probably amphibious one that you could say. Calvin Gaspo, landing assault craft might command a video edition of the Bill Trumps. Ooh, they might well do. Regards to assault craft, it turns out the uh, Florida Swamp Air boats started as World War II USN in China, uh, in China Special Forces vehicle to get across mudflats in South China. That doesn't surprise me. Consequences, how did LSTs maintain stability? Um, hope, prayer, and some good hull design. Joe, if we count a river crossing, uh, count river crossing landing operation, weren't there also a, an operation across large lakes in northern Italy? Yes. The, the trouble is, we tend to count amphibious operations are from the sea. So that's why, technically, uh, because D-Day isn't mounted from the sea, it's mounted from land, technically D-Day could be classified as the world's largest river crossing. Technically. Technically. Please don't, I'm saying technically. I know what people, it's an amphibious operation in terms of how we treat, how we examine it often. But technically, it would actually fit more with a river crossing because they're launching from land rather than from the sea. Which sounds really weird to say, but that's true. Hmm. That sounds like a really nice uh, landing craft. Was the soldiers' compartment partially covered then? No. Uh, but there was a sort of... How do I put this? Because of the where the benches were located and the sides, the benches on the sides, they could hide underneath the uh, hull. Don't joke about that, Stafford. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time a historian has faced that. <sighs> it's been very, very weird. Right. O oh, two fifteen. Oh, oh. So now I realized I mentioned it this week, but I didn't actually talk about it or read from it, so it was going to be in it in here. Combat Aircraft Designer, The Ed Hyman Story, by Edward Hyman and Rosario Rosa. 
he designed a lot of aircraft. But luckily, he does look good. Jeff Hiller, was Narvik the first allied amphibious landing? No. There had been a few done before then. And various things. Good times. Churchill College, Cambridge. Rosk collection, Roskill, number 22, sub number 1. Apparently, I was looking at it. This is from my days of my PhD research, because it's from 2013. Is that after my PhD research? Just about. Plenty of spads. Eh, yes, there's a few spads in here. A few spads. Don't ask me how much this book cost. Um, seeing as we've been talking about Midway today, it would seem sensible to talk about... Hmm. This. I wasn't optimistic about this, but Jack went ahead and requested more time through the army, which in turn asked Curtis if they would go along. The Curtis people said no, and when Jack learned their answer, some fisticuffs down there interrupted. Business is business, of course, and there are always two sides to situations like this. Nevertheless, this affair left a bad taste. I'm sure it sounds like sour grapes, but in my mind, the Curtis company at the time was an organisation without personality. As it turned up, Jack gathered up the free A blueprints and sold the entire package, concept and all, to Chance Vault, which was eager to examine Northrop technology in the stress skin area. They produced their model 143 based on the free A and gained substantially from Jack's data. Vault lost out to Sversky entry in the subsequent competition, but the company gained mileage from the data anyway. The subsequent modified 143 plans and tooling were sold to the Japanese. <sighs> In some quarters, the belief prevailed that the Zero fighter was a descendant of 143. Not so. The development of Zero was well along by this time. Meanwhile, the Navy asked Jet Industry to submit proposals for a carrier-based dive bomber. We joined the quest with other competitors. These included Vought, Curtis, Grumman, Great Lakes, and Brewster. After looking at the specifications, however, I had some second thoughts. The plane had to achieve a stable, vertical, Zero lift dives using speed brakes to keep airspeed under 250 knots. Can it withstand 9G pullouts, carrying a 1,000 pound bomb, and operate from flight decks at sea? We also have to provide a bomb displacement system capable of ejecting a weapon clear of the propeller arc while in a dive. My essential concern was the dive brakes. We were aware of the German Stuka, an excellent dive bomb which feeded slats that folded out from under the wings to slow the plane in its turn run. It was believed their steep angle diving attacks scored the most precise hits on targets such as ships and tanks. Stuka was really a 45 degree or glide bomber, not a vertical or zero lift type. Our calculations showed that the brakes would have to be very large, and I really wondered how we could keep the speed at 250 knot limit. I spent considerable time pondering over what was usually thought to be the typical dive bombing manoeuvre. It consisted of an approaching the target at about 20,000 feet, extending the brakes, pushing over or rolling in. The pilot progressively increased his dive angle to the vertical and tracked his target through the gun sight, making corrections accordingly. At 3,000 feet, he pickled the bomb and immediately commen commenced the pullout, which imposed heavy acceleration loads on the airframe. A multitude of factors were involved, including the target's direction and speed and the wind effect. Indeed, it's a very complex manoeuvre, all things considered, but one which Navy experts realised must be mastered. This was very fortunate, because dive bombing techniques and dive bombing planes were to prove vital to naval aviation success in the World War to come. I well remember the day we had to arrive at a price for building one airplane. Jack and I drove over to Santa Monica to meet with the Dutch Kinnenberger, chief engineer there. Dutch checked our weight figures, as he had more experience than the eye, agreed with them, and took us to see Henry Wetzel, Donald Douglas's assistant. Wetzel went over our proposal, and the two came up with the cost of $64,000. Seemed high at the time, and maybe it was, but on the way back... To our plant, I asked Jack how Dutch and Harry could operate that way. I couldn't get over the quick pass they'd given our proposal. That's the advantage of about 15 years of experience, Jack said. 
Fifteen years later, I was estimating contracts many times that size and clearly understood that process. The Pratt & Whitney R1534, which generated 700 horsepower, was to be used. For the basic shape of the plane, we chose a design similar to the A17, but with a 42 rather than 48 foot winter span. The aircraft was called the XBT-1 and became the first all-metal, low-wing monoplane bomber in their built-to-navy specifications. It had partially retractable landing gear and accommodations for an observer gunner in the rear seat. The trailing head flaps, which would serve as dive brakes for the attack maneuvers, were split. I designed a double, concentric cylinder hydraulic control mechanism, which permitted either the lower flap to be extended for takeoff and landing, or both upper and lower flaps extended for the dives. Both sets of flaps had to be carefully synchronized to avoid negative effects of lo on longitudinal trim during extension in dives. I had read about a linkage, a linkage system called the Scott Russell, and used the basics of it, coupled with some of my own ideas, to enhance the synchronization. This worked out quite well, and we had a minimum of problems with it, and the overall project as the first year of development and construction passed. With test flights were finally scheduled at Mains Field, Vance Breeze uh, was hired to do the job. He usually flew for us on a part-time basis. He was a Serb aviator, one of the finest I, knew, I ever knew. We paid him a resounding $2,000 for his work with XBT-1, a figure which became an inside joke some years later, after Vance had rung out the P-38 for another organisation, he earned $65,000. He took delight in showing me that rather huge check. The aircraft handled well in the horizontal mode, so it proceeded to the dive, uh, dive test stage, beginning with slow speed at shallow angles. As he steepened up the angles with the flaps extended, we ran into problems. It was customary in those days for the designer to ride along in the rear seat, with the pilot whenever possible on test flights. This practice was valuable for technical as well as psychological reasons, demonstrated to fellow employees and the world at large that the designer had confidence in his product. Of equal importance, the designer served as a professional observer to assist the pilot. This custom endured with most multiple and multi-place airplanes until the war started. After that, it was viewed as an unnecessary risk. So it was that I rode with Vance during the flights when tail, when tail flutter was occurring. With my Bell and Howell 70D camera, I twisted around and photographed the tail section. We made flight after flight, dive after dive, recording information and trying to determine what we might do to the correct situation. I don't think there is anyone who's made more 9G pull-outs than Vast Breeze and myself. Throughout, through careful measurements of a sequence of pictures, I saw that horizontal tail slips were moving through what we call an excursion of about two feet. This, to be perfectly frank, scared the hell out of me. Apparently, as speed increased, the wing wake or vortex effect from the airflow opened the open flat surfaces became severe enough to disrupt the plane's stable path through the air. The more we examined the problem, the more perplexed we came. At the same time, we were grateful that we hadn't lost XBT-1, much less our lives. We derived ironic pleasure from the inherent strength exhibited by the XBT-1's tail. It was an achievement itself that it sustained the vibrations without ripping off. We cut small sections from the edge of wing flaps, rounding them off to eliminate sharp corners, hoping this would smooth out the wind. This helped very little. We began to feel caught between a rock and a hard place. We didn't know what to set up, uh, set, step to try next. I sat back in my chair one day and took a deep breath of frustration. With this condition, I said to myself that the dive flaps could not be fully extended without the possibility of overstressing the airplane <coughs> and probably forcing it into uncontrolled flight. And without dive brakes that worked, it was generally obvious we didn't have a dive arm. Meanwhile, the government-owned sp uh, sponsor, a government-sponsored National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, prospective group of aviation advocates and researchers, devoted to advancing knowledge of flight, entered the picture in the person of Charlie Helm. He was sent El Swangano to lend his aeronautical speed tees, a uh, most fortuitous loan. Francois and I went into minute detail with Charlie, showing him the photographs, the blueprints, and our findings. After a time, he asked, "Have you tried the alternating vortex theory?" This translated into cutting holes in the flap sections. We had given that idea some thought, but discounted as too radical. Helm went on, you could try to reduce the large vortices into smaller ones with the holes. Well, we didn't have anything else going for us. I had no aces up my sleeve and was inclined to try darn near anything. I did fear that carving the holes would increase the stalling speed, and any departure from these physicians would eliminate us from con consideration. 60 knot stalling speed, by the way, was a sacred number then, dictated primarily by the carrier or landing operations of Navy planes. After agreeing to try the hull design, I thought, how will I ever explain a, a, a flap with three-inch holes that made it look like a slab of Swiss cheese? I was sincerely bothered by this, be it for aesthetic reasons or otherwise. Even before we started punching the hole, puncturing the holes, I was figuring in my mind ways to close them up if it, they didn't work. 
That same day, our mechanics brought out their fly cutters and other equipment and set about cutting holes in the inner third of the flaps adjacent to the fuselage. A series of dives were made with favourable results. More holes were cut with even better performance. Eventually, the holes ran the entire length of the flap. The flutter disappeared, we achieved 250 knots in stable flight going straight down, and we had our dive on back. A Navy inspector, Mr. Tribulus, was on hand with Charlie Helm, Vance and me, when we formally concluded that the problem had been solved. We still had to sell the Bureau in Washington on Swiss cheese flaps, but Ed Clexton, an understanding project officer and Navy man destined for flag rank, took care of that for us. This is a good book. I'm never quite sure where you can find copies of it, but if you can find a copy of it, you will enjoy it. Um, Jeff Beeler, I meant World War II. Narvik was the first out of landing with the tanks, I think. Uh, tanks were brought in after the troops a long way afterwards, and it was only a couple of them. Never enough. They never had enough tanks. That's one of the problems they faced. If Honestly, if Narvik had had you know, if they'd had more things, they'd have got a lot done a bit better. Take care, Stafford. Good luck with the ice. Trans, finding the first of anything is a huge pain. It is. Good book. And a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Now, Castle Class Corvettes. Castle Class Corvettes, an account of the service of the ships and their ships' companies. Compiled by Norman Goodwin, edited by Steve Bush. Notice that it actually is listed as Goodwin and Bush on the end, on the end here. That shows you how much work both have done. And it's an interesting one in that... There aren't many books like this of classes which are an exhaustive list of not just of the class, but this. It's their entire movements. Now, I sometimes talk about things called pink slips, which are the list of where the Royal Navy has their ships on a day-to-day -day basis, or on a free daily basis. It's a way of tracking them for a war. This is an exhaustive day-to-day -day list of their service careers, of where they were, what they were doing, and what they were up to. And it is for every single ship. Every single one. They have their details. Their entire service of the castle class. So if it's each ship, each individual ship, it's they got their thing, their service list. So if they've served longer, there's a more of them. They did less time, there's less. This one did a lot. It's got a lot. It's also got pictures. It's got good content. It is a lot of book. Hello, Sean Mac. Right then. Two days after completion, the Dumbarton Castle, the tank commander P.F. Broadhead, are in the Royal Navy Reserve, sailed for Tombury on the 27th of February 1944 for working up at Tombury. 
She was initially allocated to the 40th Escort Group, XSO, uh, but in fact joined the B5 Escort Group, which had been taken over by the X on the 7th of April 1944. She, the ship's movements between arriving on the Clyde on the 17th of March 1944 after working up and joining the B5 Escort Group are not reported. It is probable that she was used as a spare escort during this period. The Bun Castle continued with the B5 Escort Group and its successor, the 31st Escort Group, until the latter was disbanded soon after VE Day in May 1945. The B5 Escort Group, Dumbarton Castle, escorted eight convoys comprising 296 ships without loss to enemy action. The report of a service with these groups is given later under headings of BF B5 and F31 First Escort Group. She remained in commission with a reduced complement for air-sea rescue duties and subsequently underwent a refit in 1946 and was then reduced to reserve. Mm -hmm. Let's go here. And then we've got Sub-Lieutenant Peter de, uh, de Bevoir Carey Hart, served during the first year of Dumbarton Castle's final commission. His account of time proves an insight into working with these corvettes and the duties of a junior officer serving them. Sem uh, Dumbarton Castle, December 1943 to December 1944. My new ship, one of the first castle-class corvettes, being built by the Caledonians, was lying alongside the quay at Dundee. Spencer Shelley, a Lieutenant RNVR, an old Cheltonian, who had served in the Flower Class Corvettes, and I were the first to arrive and to report to our commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Broadhead, Ron A. Reserve, who had been at one time master in the BL line, but had subsequently become a very successful barrister specialising in maritime law. Being prior to, uh, prior to joining Dunbarton Castle, he had brought a northern trawler with a mutinous crew back to UK from the Med. He told me that during that voyage he had always slept with a loaded pistol on his pillow. Also because of his experience, uh, this experience, he was a very firm disciplinarian. Sharon and I found, uh, found our CEO in a Nissan hut on the quay, which was our temporary office until the arrival of the ship's company. After we had reported to Broadhead, he strode up and down. He was rather short and slightly tubby. Remind me of Captain Bly as he portrayed in the picture entitled Mutiny in the Bounty. He gave Shelley the choice of you taking over the duties of the gunnery officer, navigator, or ASCO. Uh, ASCO. And although Shelley decided he preferred to be guns, he was told that he was to be navigator, whilst I became the pinger. We were both sent on appropriate weekly courses, my destination being Osprey at Dunnerun and Nimrod at Campbellton. At the latter, we played with a submarine in which my cousin David Carey was serving as a sub-lieutenant, and who later lost his lose life in the X-Craft. After our return from respective courses, the commissioning party, which included Lieutenant Ruskill, RNVR, the first lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Jones, gunnery officer, and Sub-Lieutenant Colvin arrived. Following several days of sea trials, we sailed for Tombarrow, the western approaches working up based in Mull. Before leaving Dundee, Broadhead had written to Admiral Contract built ships, proposing that a, cha a change in the pitch of the propeller could give the ship an extra one and a half knots, an extra 10% of speed. Some weeks later, a rather curt letter arrived, suggesting Broadhead would do better than mind his own business. It was rather incensed, but at last laughed since the pitch was later changed and he was proved to be right. Commodore Western Isles, with his HQ at Western, aboard Western Isles, was Admiral Sir Gilbert Stevenson, better known as Monkey Stevenson, a man for whom I have had the most tremendous admiration and someone I got to know after the war when I was commanding a Sea Cadet Corps unit. The war had brought him from retirement, and as an old man, he was a beach master at Dunkirk and a Commodore of convoys. Everybody was terrified of him and dreaded his visits to their ships. He would arrive on board a ship like a charge of dynamite. Number one, the captain is dead. There is a fire in the engine room and a mine under your bows. Do something! Twice, whilst I was ashore in charge of squad of seamen under gun and field training, he would come. He came running towards me. Do something! Make them think! Make them think! If he thought that any officer was inefficient from CAOs downwards, they would be replaced and sent aboard Western Isles for several months of extensive retraining. I made two visits in different ships and felt certain that I would be imprisoned in Western Isles, but I need not be worried, have worried. As after the war, when I was sailing with Broadhead, he told me that Monkey had been pleased with me. He used to send his aides during the dark hours to steal ships' logs from sleeping quartermasters. On a previous visit to Tombury, Shelley had climbed the Western Isles cable during the middle watch, entered Monkey's cabin and told him that he had captured his ship. Monkey was thrilled and kept the ship's company at action stations whilst he and Shelley enjoyed several whiskies.
On leaving Tombury, after three weeks of unpleasant time, we sailed to Greenock, where we joined an escort group, B5. Our senior officer was in X, a river-class frigate, and the rest of the group comprised of Antigua, an all-welded American-built frigate, three and three other castles, Hadley, Berkeley, and Carisbrook. After one or two anti-submarine patrols, we found ourselves escorting convoys to and from Gibraltar. In order to avoid the German aircraft, we used to sail 30 degrees west before steaming either due south or due north. At that time, escort, the escort carriers were arriving from the States, Campania, Narina, Emperor all of which, as soon as they arrived in the UK from the States, went into dockyard hands so that their bunks and canteens could be removed, and in our customary escort position of S for Sugar, we were frequently acting as escort to one of these carriers when she was turning into wind so that her aircraft could take off and land. Landing was not so easy, and we witnessed frequent crashes. Sometimes we escorted the tankers, which sailed from one convoy to another in order to refuel the escort vessels. These convoys were of the 8-knot variety, a speed which was often reduced to due to bad weather and stragglers. At ASCO, my action station was, of course, in the Aztec compartment, which was suited, uh, situated after the bridge and where I had a team of four, a leading hand and three ABs, operating the bearing range and depth recorders. We were one of the first ships to be fitted with a squid, a head throwing weapon, and a sword depth re re recording oscillator. The dome for the main Aztec oscillator could not be housed internally, as in later vessels. It had to be raised and lowered using a, a small davit situated on the upper deck. An operation which could be extremely tricky, and I am unlikely to forget Broadhead's wrap on the occasion when we missed the tide on our main voyage because I took so long at my first attempt to put the dome in the place. My entering harbour station was always on the bridge, with Broadhead, who could handle this single screw vessel like a motor car and never got ruffled, chatting to me during the most tricky pieces of ship handling. Hart, are you going to see that wren of yours this evening? Starboard five. Are you going to take her out to dinner? So I had. Taking her to the Bay Hotel, no doubt. Midships. I'd say that this jolly pr uh, pretty NT driver on the way, Quay. Uh, stop engines. If she has some signals for us, let us invite her aboard for a copy. Slow stone. I like her hairdo. Stop engines. <coughs> we were based in Greenock, and then a round trip to Gib and back usually took five weeks. The jib and back. Following uh, by a week outside, uh, alongside either at Gr Gurk Pier or Great Harbour, whilst boiler cleaning was in progress. From time to time, we carried the odd passenger, and on one occasion, we were oiling at Mulville after exercising with Isle of Stark, formerly one of the mailboats running between Southampton and Channel Isles in the Irish Sea, received a signal to say that there was an outbreak of smallpox in Gibraltar and that no one would be allowed ashore there unless they had been very recently vaccinated. Fortunately, a Polish Air Force doctor was taking passivists and he vaccinated the entire ship company with a sewing needle sterilised in the flame of the candle. On another occasion, we brought an RAF Commodore back from Jib to Granock. Whilst customs officials were boarding us from their launch on the port side, all the Commodore's duty-free rabbits were being loaded onto an RAF launch lying on our starboard quarter. It's a good book. It is a lovely book. Okay. Do you want to show you? So that's how the Swiss cheese flaps cut SBD came out. Uh, Swiss cheese flaps on the, of the SBD came out. Yes, that's from the early Ed Heim book. Um, then, uh, Dylan Lillard, I feel as if naming a whole mass production ship after castles you have is both a, a boast in that you can mass produce ships, but also that you can mass produce castles. I, 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 I comment nothing, but, um, yeah. Cosmos, what is the date range for that? It's the whole castle class, so it's their service. Denon Clap, I remember the Dan Snow Battle Castle series. One of them was on Conway Castle and how Edward I essentially spammed the car place castle here button around North Wales. Yes, it was called the uh, Ring of Stone. I think, yeah, or the Stone Curtain, depending on uh, which historian you're talking to. Hmm, Jennif. Good night, Dr. Rouse. Have been great listen. However, I must make tracks to the work. See you next time. Take care, Jay. Thank you. Strong Mac, the clock. Is there anything that has actual top speed of a Black Swan class, given certain facts about the speed uh, attainable in service? Mm, not really. Black Swans were pretty interesting. Um, they were basically, in some respects, um, speedboats. Uh, didn't uh, didn't I grew up in Jersey, so the main castles I was exposed to as a child were Elizabeth and, Mo and Montauga. 
Both heavily change over time. You can really see the different centuries in each. Yeah, that's cool. <sighs> yeah, this book is full of those little stories. It's what I love. It has the profile, has the ship's history, and then it has different things from various people involved in the ship and their accounts. In it. It's a really, really lovely book. If you like this sort of thing, if you like ship histories, if you like learning about individual ships, and honestly, at some point, I am going to do something on the Corvettes. I am going to do a, a video or a long patrol or a live or something about the Corvettes. I might add that into February set, actually. It'd be fun to do. Right then. So. O two forty one. Right now, the Imperial Japanese Navy. I was going. I was asking. There are only fourteen of this class completed. Um. So. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty two, twenty four, twenty six, twenty eight, thirty, thirty two, thirty four, thirty six, thirty eight, thirty nine. Well, I've got 39 in here, and that wouldn't surprise me, because they serve with the Royal Navy, the Canadian Navy, and the Norwegian Navy. So there are HMSs, there are HMCSs, and there is an HM uh, NOMS in here. Tunsberg Castle on 353, let's see. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, Dunsmoke Castle. I was asking, oh, so, okay, sorry, didn't see the additional tables on Wikipages. Always be careful of additional pages on Wikipages. I was like, yes, please, those little ships are cute and usually underappreciated. There are. That's why I do a lot of work on sloops. John Hart, when did electric searchlights start to make an appearance on warships? Now, I know when it was Royal Navy, but I have a feeling the US Navy had them first. So let me just check that one. The Royal Navy used searchlights in 1882 to prevent Egyptian forces from manning artillery batteries at Alexandria. So that's done. But the US Navy does seem to have been trying to fit them from about a little bit a year before that. So maybe the Royal Navy is fitting them at the same time, maybe not. I'm not quite sure. Um, I know they were used during the Siege of Paris as well, apparently, according to this. Mm, always fun. So, Imperial Japanese Navy at War in the Pacific War by Marcus Still. It's a cool book. It's one of the better books I find for any. If you want to start as an introduction to the Japanese Navy, it's one of the better books to start with. Because it goes through it all. And 
we started off with let's go with some of the really something that's really really forgotten was something in Japan out. Also has some cute paintings in it. Some gorgeous paintings. The units of the C-Class were intended as attack boats to operate with A-type command boats and B-type scout submarines. Yes, they had A-type, B-type, and C-types. Their design was based on the KD-6 with an increase of two torpedo tubes to provide maximum firepower. The eight forward tubes were arranged in two forward torpedo rooms, one above the other. The C-1 boats were also more maneuverable underwater than the KD-6. Eight 21-inch bow torpedo tubes and 20 torpedoes, one 5.5-inch DAC gun mounted aft, one 25, twin 25mm anti-aircraft gun fitted on the conning tower. No aircraft were carried. Each boat was provided with fittings aft of the conning tower to carry one Type A midget submarine. In early 1943, I-16 was modified for duties as a supply summary. The forward 5.5-inch gun was removed, the number of torpedo reloads was reduced, and the fittings were provided aft for a dihutzel. The class saw was very active during the war, and made extensive use of its ability to carry midget submarines. All five units were engaged in the attack on Pearl Harbor, with each carrying a midget submarine. I-16, I-18, and I-20 were deployed to the Indian Ocean, where they used their midget submarine to attack British shipping in Diego Sarez. The attack heavily damaged battleship HMS Ramleys and sank a tanker. The boats later sank 14 freighters in the Indian Ocean as commerce raiders. Later, I-16 and I-20 each launched three more midget attacks off Guadalcanal. Only a single USN transport was damaged. While being used as supply submarines, I-18 was sunk in February 1943 and I-16 in June 1944, both by U.S. destroyers. I-20 was also sunk in the Solomons by U.S. destroyers in September 1943. I-22 and I-24 were used to ferry midget submarines to attack Sydney, Australia, in May 1942. The attack was a failure, sinking only an old accommodation ferry. I-22 was reported as missing in the Eastern Solomons in October 1942. After the attack on Sydney, I-24 sank a freighter. I-24 was also used to launch two midget attacks on Guadalcanal. It was later used for supply missions to Solomon. In, July, in June 1943, the 2,500 ton submarine was rounded and sunk off the Aleutians by a 675 ton sub chaser. It's cool. It's a very good book. Yamato. Right, I'll be back in a second. Again. Big glass of iron. Ooh. But no, this is it's a good book, my Mark style. And it's one I highly recommend. And I'm putting it back there because otherwise I will put it somewhere and my mum will nick it. There it's far enough away that she probably won't get to it. Right then. 
Beyond the Spitfire. I was actually asked by someone if I had this this week, and it was one of the interesting things because I think it was Dan, Dan Freeman asked me if I had it. Okay. Um, I, I had it on order, but it hadn't come for a long, until actually after I'd done the Supermarine videos. And in some ways that's good, in some ways it was annoying. Because in some ways it meant that I was far more independent in my um, things than I might have been if I'd read this in my analysis. But, you know, it's a good book. Uh, also, what was annoying was in Amazon fashion, it got bashed on the way, which is unusual for Amazon's books. But, you know, worse things happen to see. And it is a very good book. It's got... some very interesting and very cool graphics. It doesn't really answer, but does answer in some ways the, uh, some of the ideas I have. I said, it doesn't give me an answer on... The uh, on the joy that is the potential naval fighter. It doesn't. It isn't in there, and that doesn't surprise me. There will always be programs, and there'll be programs. The fact that he keeps trying to get the Royal Navy to take a twin-engine aircraft is kind of an interesting one. That's his answer to the swordfish. S930, this is what Supermarine were proposing. Twin-engined, biplane, monocoque, uh, monocoque um, profile. It's an interesting aircraft. I'm not sure which carrier they've pictured below. I don't think the Royal Navy's ever had a carrier that looked like that. I, I, I think they've managed to imagine a carrier and that definitely they didn't... That it, for example, there was no carrier built with that kind of thing on the flight deck. You don't add that kind of thing on the flight deck, on the British flight deck. You would get... Anyone who tried to weld a cylinder onto a flight deck for an AA gun would get told... Or would get kicked off. The whole purpose is you don't want anything on the flight deck. But it is a very cool book. It's got some lovely pictures in it. Lovely stuff about the company. Lovely details about the aircraft they're designing. Really, it was it's quite nice after reading it to find that after I'd done mine that somehow actually also this book also agreed with me quite a lot, and this was obviously is far more of an expert on the submarine than I am. Frank Whittle was attached to the Royal Air Force. He didn't really do a design. He didn't really do a firm. He worked with a few, but he was mainly an Air Force agent. And this, of course, is the gull-winged beauty. What I like, especially like about this author, is he's remembered that aircraft doesn't need an S. It's now very clear that Mitchell's intention from the start was to tender a monoplane design. But in a very early phase of the project, he hedged his bets and drew up a biplane in parallel as a backup and reference point for a comparison of the monoplane. Mitchell's second decision was to adopt the evaporatively, uh, evaporatively called Rolls-Royce Goshawk, still called the Kestrel S at this point at this time for both designs. He had formed a close association with the Rolls-Royce Experimental Department for a through their joint work on the Schneider Trophy Racing Aircraft for 1929-1931 contest, once he had a high regard for their capability. 
Their racing R engines had never faltered in this aircraft, delivered more power than initially planned in all respects, had set up a standard that the competition had failed to match. When the company introduced the concept of evaporative cooling for their engines, Mitchell was most enthusiastic to incorporate this into his aircraft designs, as it offered the potential for a significant reduction in both weight and drag. Hence its patents for wing-leading edge condensers. Furthermore, the first experimental versions of the Kestrel S had recently commenced the flight testing in Southampton 2 and would provide useful data. Therefore, it was very in entirely natural that he should choose to power his fighter with one of these engines, even had the Air Ministry not dropped large hints that they too favoured them. The two aircraft designs started life as the Type 178 and as the one as 178-10. We're subbing a split between the 178-14 and 178-12, respectively, the earliest surviving layout drawings from February 1931. After some preliminary wind tunnel tests had taken place in Vickers facilities and several months prior to the official release of, of specification F-730. Yes. So, even the official aircraft of specifications, the ideas for them are often leaked before the specifications are made official and before anything starts officially. So this is even official aircraft. Production can start and stuff can be worked out years ago. For example, we're talking about events in pretty much 1929, and the official specification is F-730, which is starts the fighter development. Dan Reem, Widow was traded, I think, from someone else to Rolls-Royce, maybe Gloucester? I'd have to look it up, but in my experience, Whittle basically worked for the Air Ministry, and if he was attached to any company, it was temporary and sent by the Air Ministry. But maybe I'm wrong. But he just seems to move around quite a bit. Let's see. Well, he served with the Royal Air Force to 1948, so I would, and reached the rank of Air Commodore. So I have a feeling that he pretty much is an Air, and Air Ministry engineer. And he goes where the Air Ministry sends him. He's an Air Ministry officer. Okay. Mitchell's biplane fighter appears to be conceived as a fairly conventional aircraft of the period, broadly comparable to the Hawker Fury in layout. Fuse Arch was constructed around cross braced metal long ones and formers, and it's believed that it was intended to be skinned, at least in part, with non low bearing metal pa and panels. The cockpit was positioned quite high in order to provide a pilot with a few degrees of forward but downward view over the knees. Two Vickers machine guns were mounted above the engine, with their breeches in the cockpit. The exhaust pipes from the engine were carried back to behind the cockpit, the opening, in order to avoid problems with glare during night operations. The metal frame wings were of unequal span, heavily staggered and bracing in single bays of end struts. Leading edges of all four planes incorporated the steam condensers, and hence were metal skinned with the remainder, fa uh, remainder when fabric covered. The top wing was positioned ahead of the cockpit, and just above the pilot's eye line in order to minimise the, um, minimize the blind zone, whilst the lower wing was directly below the cockpit with trailing edge uh, cutouts so that a view forward and downward was reasonably unobstructed. The top wing was fitted with leading edge sluts and aerons, while the lower wing housed two more Vickers guns firing outside the propeller disc. Although considered the thin wing, uh, thin wing, it appears doubtful they would have been fitted without substantial blisters or fairings. There's also a semi-recessed bomb rack for, uh, for four two 20-pound bombs under each, uh, provided on each wing, or on, under the right wing. The undercarriage wheels had independent suspension, brakes that could be operated differently in order to facilitate ground handling and were enclosed in spats, in many ways. 
This aircraft's parallel, uh, parallel work underway at Hawker on developed versions of Fury that would lead to their own submission to F-730. As Mitchell did not regard this project as his primary design, it may well have been considered simply as a benchmark against time in which to compare the monoplane fighter. It's a cool, it's a cool book, and it is a very interesting read. And it's worthwhile reading. Um, Shumak, are you implying that some aid was told to tell the companies that what they wanted with a plane so that when, it, when issued, the process would go faster? Oh, are you suggesting such a collusion between state and private corporations? <sighs> Chilling, chilling. Karl Harman, how good are the submarine swordfish? Uh, they're pretty fancy, but uh, the Royal Navy does go. <coughs> the Garam does go to ferry for a reason. Probably reliability and ability to produce the numbers. Although, seeing as that was taken over by Blackburn, um, probably someone, uh, you know, someone was more uh, uh, more attentive. Don't I'm actually the fact that the doctor knows that it's aircraft, not aircrafts. Since before I couldn't figure out uh, which one was the right way to say it and just confuse me a lot. It's aircraft. Okay? You can have five aircraft, one aircraft, an aircraft, a dozen aircraft. It doesn't matter. There is never an S. Joe Sassy, Power Jets LTD was a company set up by Whittle and two colleagues in 1956 to develop his jet engine ideas. That was after the Air Ministry refused to give him five pounds to renew the patent on his jet engine. It was nationalised in 1944. Yeah, nationalised. Yay! It was set up with two former um, uh, free. It was basically set up by three RF gents. But the Dan Freeman, stop doing it. That's cruel. <sighs> no, it's a good book. It is a good book. I enjoy it, and I don't think as the reason I had both these books in here was because I don't think with either one you will ever get the full story. Both of them worked on too many very, very interesting government projects. Both of them were too productive, and the whole groups were too productive that I... Yeah. It's not the case we will ever know the full amount of aircraft they produce. I wouldn't even... Even if they produced the list and listed out, I wouldn't even trust it. Speaking as a historian, I would go... Approximate. Uh, this is probability or something, because there's probably going to be aircraft which they don't put on list because they are black projects or projects which never kind of come up or never get uh, never reach more than the design table stage, and therefore they might not consider them to be proper projects. So, next book. Oh, free, oh, free. U.S. Marine Corps aviation since, well, since it began, 1912. And for those who do like the U.S. Marine Corps, this is a very cool book. Seeing as we have been talking about the US Marine Corps earlier with the Big Fruit or United Fruit scenario, it does seem so it's worthwhile bringing up. Also, I do find it interesting that that, the Corsair, is more associated with the US Marine Corps rather than the Royal Navy, when it's the Royal Navy who wanted to turn it into a fighter that it became, whereas the US Marine Corps were just basically going, is this what we're getting? Really? Can we have more LGATs? But of course, it goes on to become something fantastic. And this is the fourth edition of the book. 
I'm not sure if they reached a fifth edition. It's got a foreword by Senator John H. Glenn. Always fun to get a senator to give a foreword. Fixed-wing developments in the 1950s. While the Marine Corps created a place for the helicopter, several fixed-wing aircraft were finding their way into the inventory, most of them becoming classics in the years to come. The battle-tested Gronham F9F series continued to serve after Korea, having established a reputation for toughness in combat with VMF-115 and VMF-311, as well as several Navy carrier squadrons. As the war drew to a close, the more powerful F9F5 was entering combat overseas. The next variant, the F9F6, was radical enough to warrant a new name, the Cougar. Many US companies by this time had tried to establish an image for their aircraft by using a common series name. Therefore, Grumman used cat names. Wildcat, Hellcat, Panther, and Cougar. Douglas used the Sky prefix. Sky Knight, Sky Ray for the F4D, and Skyhawk. And McDonald entered the spirit with names like Phantom, Demon, the Navy's F3H fighters, and Voodoo, the Air Force's heavy fighter. The routine was quite effective as a public relations tool. For some reason, if I'm flying an aircraft named Voodoo, I would expect it to be, how do I put this politely, a little bit more mysterious than the, F1, uh, the F101 was. The XF9F6 used 35 degree swept wings and first flew on September 20th, 1951. By December 1952, the straight wing Panther had been supplemented on production lines by the 6 Cougar, and ultimately the 7 and 8 models. There were several modifications for these aircraft, including a two seat trainer and long nosed photo carnassus variants. Two seater served in combat, the only model of the Cougar to do so, and only in Vietnam as a marine recon forward air control platform. Although used mainly by Navy carrier squadrons, the Cougar did fly with a number of marine units, especially the attack role and the photo reconnaissance role, as the F9F8P. VMA-312 had returned from Korea in June 1953 and had been re reassigned to the newly created 3rd MAW as part of the MAG-32. Uh, there is one thing I do point out about this. Make sure you read at the beginning the acronyms page. because. This is one of those authors and one of those books which they machine gun acronyms at you. On February the 15th, 1954, the squadron was redesignated as a VMF. During this period, it had traded its veteran F4U Corsairs for the more modern F9F Panther. However, by November, VMA 312 had a new aircraft, the North American FJ2 Fury, basically a navalized F86. The original straight-winged FJ-1 was served with only a few Navy squadrons for only a few years, with limited success. Its main purpose, along with its contemporary, the FH-1 Phantom, was to indoctrinate the Navy in jet carrier operations. Mm -hmm. That's a cool one. Greg uh, Shumack. Something tells me he got paid way more than five pounds for it when it was nationalized. Not much more, though. Um, come on, don't, don't forget me. The different British accents might be more different from each other than the Slavic languages of dual man. Okay. Ooh, trust me. We can have fun. Because I say, of course, grass. My girlfriend would say grass. 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 I roll my R's because that's where I come from, what we do. It's fun. Uh, Dan Freeman, I think there are maybe three aircraft I would happily see in service today from World War II, and one of those is the Corsair, the others being the Catalina and Swordfish. Why would you wish the Corsair in I love the Corsair as well, but why? That landing. I, give me a Hellcat. You know, th th that you can land still. And survive. And get away from. Even though it's got a huge, great engine. 
Juicy season. I've often wondered how some of the English planes would have responded to US engines, like P-51 did with Merlin. Uh, I have an idea from Mosquito with the double wasps from P-47. Well, if you want to send an airspeed record on really scared of Germans, you could do that. Aviate Enterprise. Machine gun of acronyms. Think of NASA. <laughs> oh, trust me, I have. Peter Dawson. Uh, Peter Dawson. Which series of aircraft acronyms? Pre 1962, US Air Force, USN, post 62. Uh, pre and post. It's got both sets in there. So after all, it is since 1912. That's a fun thing. And as you know, that book tends to sit there for reasons of various projects. People keep asking me questions about US Marine Corps aviation lately, so, you know, it just seems sensible. Adam. The British warship design in World War II. Select papers. Now, I know I like to bring this book up quite often, but um, honestly, I got it down this week to talk about, to, uh, because I answer a question on submarine design, and I thought, well, I've read to you the landing craft pages on it. I haven't ever read the submarine ones on it. And it has, of course, in it as content... Ships of the Invasion Fleet, Merchant Aircraft Carrier Ships, that's Mack Ship Designs, British Submarine Design in the war, during the war, Corvettes and Frigates, Coastal Forces, and Notes and Development of Landing Craft. So, I thought I'd go for the submarines this time. Although, Mack Ships are always fun. And helpfully, it opens straight up Mack Ships. So, da -da 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 -da. This was written in 1947, this particular chapter. In this paper, the Royal Navy at the outbreak of war, Sir Tanley Goodall, KCB OB, has given us some details of the two latest types of submarines, the UNT class in service at the outbreak of recent war. It's worthwhile reading. An examination of the tables provided with the paper will show that the three aircraft, or three of the, each of these types, was completed at the time. At the time. There are also 12 S-Class submarines, 6 mine laying submarines of the Porpoise class, and 3 fleet submarines of the River class. The remainder of the submarine fleet comprised the O, P, and R classes. Programmed in the later 1920s, and a number of H and L classes completed or laid down during the 1914-18 Club War. The pre-war designs of S, U, and T classes formed the basis of all submarines which completed during the war in time to take part in operations. Many changes in the feature of these submarines were, however, required as the war progressed. This resulted in designs being completely reviewed on several occasions. The advances of offensive and defensive qualities brought about by war experiences were embodied as quickly as design considerations and limited available building capacity permitted. Several new designs were produced for special purposes. But again, the first half of the war, the decision was always that their advantages were not sufficient to counterbalance the disturbance of the building program. The building program. Uh, towards the end of 1941, however, it was decided to proceed with the design of the A-Class, with a view to its insertion in the building program at a time when the builders could take in it in their stride. These submarines were about to be delivered at frequent intervals when the war ended. In fact, the A-Class formed the basis of the Royal Navy submarine fleet post-World War II, and it's really one of the interesting things is that, again, it's one of the arguments I use against people going, oh, Britain's broken, Britain's terrible at the end of World War II. Well, we're introducing a whole new generation of top-of-the-range submarines that incorporate all war experience. Yes, you can say that's not that expensive a thing, but you can also say that, frankly, that's not the action of someone who's retreating from the world. Reference must also be made to the midget submarine designs of the X and XE types, and with this should be associated the design of chariots, the name given to the British type of human torpedo. 
These vessels required a diversion of the design effort, disproportionately greater than their size, but naval history now testifies that this was worthwhile. SUNT classes, section two. The principal design particulars concerning these classes are given in the accompanying table. There are several minor differences between vessels of any one class. The S-class submarines were designed for offensive patrols in confined waters, i.e. the Mediterranean and the North Sea. A small pre-war building programs between 1929 and 1935 and afforded the opportunity of successfully eliminating minor troubles with this class and bringing design to continually up to date. Operationally, experience during the opening months of the war showed that these submarines were very suitable for North Sea work and they were economical as far as production was concerned. The design was therefore further reviewed early in 1940 in order to incorporate such war experience as it had been obtained, a decision given that submarines of this class were to be inserted in the building program. S-class submarines were built in fairly large numbers up to the end of the war, the last vessel being delivered just after the conclusion of her facilities. The last vessel, however, was greatly different in detail from the first. The hull construction showed a complete transformation from riveting to welding, with consequential improvement in the robustness of the hull against counterattack, and increase in the diving depth. The submarines built at the beginning of the war had welded frames and riveted to pressure hull seams and butts, as experiments had shown the, in some doubt as to the wisdom of welding pressure hull planting at the time. The advance of welding technique as the war progressed, the complete adoption of this process became possible. A stern-firing external torpedo tube was added to the submarines built in the early part of the war, but this was later precluded by the decision to substitute a 4-inch gun for the 3-inch gun in certain vessels. With the movement of the war to the Far East, the endurance was appreciably increased by converting certain of the main ballast tanks to oil fuel tanks. Experience prior to the war had shown difficulty in carrying oil fuel in riveted external tanks, since working of the structures, aggravated by bumping when alongside, had given rise to leakage through the rivets. The possibility of telltale tracks being left in the water had made it necessary to stow all the oil fuel inside the pressure hull. With the adoption of welded external tanks, however, the difficulties with riveted structure almost entirely disappeared, and it was again possible to carry oil fuel outboard. Further alterations made this class as discussed under Section 4. Four. The original U-class submarines were intended primarily to replace for both pro-submarine and anti-submarine training purposes the historic H-class, which had given such a standing service during the, the since the, and since the 1914-18 war. At the same time, they were destined to design for short-distance wartime patrols. The first three vessels, Undine, Und Unity, and Ursula, were completed August, October, and December 1938, respectively, and were the only ones available at the outbreak of war. During the war, the design was progressively kept up to date, and the submarines of this class were built in fairly large numbers. From the time it will be seen that they had diesel electric to drive, and the simplicity of the machinery arrangements greatly facilitated rapid production. These submarines of limited operational qualities were destined to prove very suitable for work in the Mediterranean, especially during those periods when it was possible to operate from Malta. See the U class series, which I, the U class, uh, the 10th submarine flotilla, which I talked about in the submarine war videos a few weeks a few months back or weeks back a few weeks back actually in the pre-war submarines of the class the external torpedo tubes had caused the superstructure forward to be of a rather bluff shape this involves some disadvantages in periscope depth keeping aggravated by the comparatively short periscopes with which this class had to be equipped the visibility of the rather prominent bow wave and in the loss of speed in a seaway later vessels had the bow find the length being gets slightly increased the result the fitting of the operational equipment made it necessary to forego these tubes in later submarines of this type. The already good diving qualities of the U-class were improved by the addition of a quick diving tank, which also assisted in giving better control during torpedo firing. This tank enables the submarine to be made deliberately heavy and has been a feature of British submarines for some time. The construction of this class was interrupted before they were adapted for complete construction by welding. The partial measure of welding the pressure hull frames and bo uh, butts of the plating were adopted in later wartime construction new class, but the pressure hull plating seams were riveted throughout. The T-class submarines of the patrol type and were designed to replace o, o P, and R classes. The very first vessel, Triton, appeared in 1935 building program. Third vessels of this class were included in subsequent pre-war and wartime building programs, and it was only when the preparations for the building the A-class were well advanced and then that it was decided not to order further vessels of the T-class. Commencement of war, only three vessels of the class had been completed, Triton, Triumph, and Thistle, although several others were in various stages of construction. Every effort was made during the war to obtain larger numbers of this very successful and very useful type of submarine. But the need for numbers made it necessary to curtail the program to some extent in favour of the more easily built UNS classes. 
As in the S-Class, it was possible to change over to complete welding on T-Class with the resulting improvement in hull strength. This endurance was also increased for work in the Far East by converting certain main tanks to carry oil fuel. T-Class have, generally, two external torpedo tubes forward, and the effect with which these had on the bow casing in the earliest vessels of the class was similar to that of the new class. Later vessels were fi uh, fined in this position, the lit ends of the two tubes projecting to some extent through the casing, and suitable fairing being provided. The two external tubes were also provided amidships, or pointing forwards in earlier vessels but aft in later vessels in order to provide a stern firing salvo. This salvo was augmented in later vessels by the provision of an additional tube in the after end of the casing. And it's got some lovely drawings of them. S class, U class, D class. Hmm. That my issue with World War Two era submarines and earlier is how flimsy and lethal to their own crews they all seem. Uh yeah. They were. It's a good old book though. Where did I get it out of? It was in there. That's where Norman Tolman book goes. So. This one goes up there. Next book. Oh, 322. Now, Black Swan class sloops. Les Brown, detailed in the original shipbuilder's plans. Now, I know I've talked about this one before. I know I've mentioned it before, but I like sloops. And I was talking about Castle Class Corvettes, and honestly, this week I was asked a question about Black Swan class sloops and their speeds. So, of course, this was the book I got out, and therefore it was sitting here, so it was part of the Random History Collection. And I have explained in the description of this video what Random History means for me. It, of course, has the to-be-expected and always-beloved Uber massive fold out. Yes. That allows you to see everything. Everything. There is nothing of this one you cannot know. You will see it all. You will see it all. You will. It's. A lot of fun. And it's a really cool book with a lot of great history in it. You have to be careful of the corners, though. They can bend back like anything in this series. So my one complaint about them, I wish they were made of slightly thicker paper. I do understand the expense that would cause and the issues that would cause in other ways, but it, they, they do have bendy ends, and it, it does worry me. That's nice details about the guns and the sighting and how they could operate, where they were, what they had in them. And I always love the way they have this sort of protection. They give you the details, and you can match up frames with other uh, other plans. So it gives you a really good idea for producing a 3D image if you want to do that. Because I know you can't always get 3D computer graphics, but it's nice to have the ability to produce them. Mm. 
And of course, this HMS Amethyst of the Amethyst Incident. When completed, HMS Amethyst carried two 20mm Oricon mount, gun mounts on the quarterdeck, as did Starling, but with a different pl a platform for the gun mounting. She only had a single 20mm mount on her both as gun platform, rather than the twin mountings of Starling, but both ships were ca also carried a single 20mm guns on the sponsons at the single, uh, signal deck level. The arrangement of depth charge rails and throwers on the quarter deck were the same, although Sturge's spare depth charges was different. Amethyst was fitted with a split Hedgehog ASW mortar. Both uh, ships, uh, both sloops carried the, fr uh, the three twin four inch gun mountings at the same locations, but the arrangements of the RU lockers were differed. Amethyst was not fitted with a lattice mast uh, aft, but a type 271 radar, having a simple aerial support instead. But Starling's tripod mast was replaced with a lattice mast forward which carried a Type 272 radar lantern. The boat arrangements for, of the two sloops were the same, 27-foot whaler and 25-foot cutter to starboard and a 16-foot dinghy to port, all on davits, although the arrangements of cardi floats differed. The number of smoke floats on the Amethyst were, was the same as on Starling, but four were mounted on the stern and two at the bow, rather than being mounted amidships as on Starling. Amethyst was not fitted with a 44-inch Starlight a searchlight projector on the gun platform, but carried two 20-inch searchlight projectors at the aft end of the bridge deck, where the searchlight manipulators had been fitted on Starling. Number one RDF office on the on Starling was offset to port at the back of the superstructure below the tripod mast, but the number type 29 radar office on Amethyst was sighted on centerline at the base of the lattice mast. The arrangement of accommodation and other officers on the upper deck was very similar. <coughs> the upper part of the ballast tank space between frames 119 and 112 on Starling were used for the storage of small arms ammunition on Amethyst, but otherwise arrangements on the lower deck and hold were also very similar. So it, what I like about this book is it shows you the differences. It shows you through the class, it does go through them, it gives you a very interesting overview of the of what they were. And they were a in, really interesting class. Down to him, a different set or sort of centerfold showing you know, everything to what one might expect from a chap in his bedroom. I do not know what you mean, Dan. I do not understand this at all. I know it's nearly half past nine, but my little cousins may still be watching. I have no idea. Guys, these following uh, blueprint pages are the best things before 3D computer graphics. That they are. That they are. And frankly, you won't get... You, with them, you can build very good 3D computer graphics. Again, putting this back before it gets nicked. Most people don't understand. The main thing I'm looking... One of the major things I'm looking forward to in my office. A lockable door. That I can hide books behind. Just have to be careful to make sure there are no spare keys made. Hmm. In you go, Jingo. Mm -hmm. well, that might be better. That probably be a lot better. There we go. Cajun, we'll just send you a sister, a sister a set of lockpicks. Is he thinking that my sister doesn't already have a set? Dan Freeman was really br bringing the trainee assistant, fluffy research assistant, see you just an excuse to grab a new book. One may have disappeared from the pile to my right. One has to be careful about these things. And today's last book... Before we get into question session...
Don't remember that. The day you put in a lock on your door is the day that your mom starts to watch lo how to put the lock pick on your YouTube. A. Eh? What makes you think again? She doesn't know. B. If you think I'm just going to leave it at just a locked door, the locked door is going to be the warning. There will be something else behind it. I am a product of my family. They are lovely. We are all have a very similar mindset when it comes to getting into places. This brought up, uh, come on, this brought up the, the, that fire in Gerald Durrell's art compound, where thick old wooden cabinets saved precious documentation. Yes, thick wooden. Hmm. Anyway, today's last book. The Naval Institute, so a guide to the Soviet Navy, 5th edition, Norman Palmer. I love this book. I don't get to talk about the Soviet Navy as much as I really would like, because I can some actually a really cool Navy to learn from. They get given a lot of... Mm -hmm. But they don't deserve it. Eric Kaufman, hooking up shotguns to locked door is illegal. Yeah, I know that's illegal. That uh, you think I'm going to use something subtle, subtle as a shotgun? I'll have you know I have all sorts of plans. <laughs> Soviet Navy. When was it published? Uh, this particular edition was published in 1991. So there's still roughly a Soviet Navy when it's being written. Original edition, 1986. It's a good book. And I am actually have to say, to make sure I can get over my railway on the bookshelves, I am planning on sitting on, on putting in a, um, a a bookshelf ladder that will run across the room on a metal pole and sort of have uh, have wheels down the bottom. But my plan is to also have it so it's sort of on a flexible thing, so I can pick it up and put it, position it. At a rest point up above, so it's not on the floor the whole time. So, you know, there's lots of interesting things. <laughs> Glitter bomb. Yeah, that's always a good one. There are plans. I do agree with the Eric Downer Cameras. Eric Calhoun, that will do more damage to the room than the books. Do not recommend. Um, trap door with snake pit. I might have to interrupt the concrete foundations for that one. I'm not doing that. But. Now, if you think there are, there are going to be lots of very noisy things set off, let's put it this way. So, let's go through amphibious warfare ships. One by one, people tell me, Peter the Great, and all the, the, the new stuff, the sort of, some of the new warships they are, um, amphibious warships they're building, oh, they're completely new. And you sort of go, have you looked at the designs from the 1970s? The number of amphibious ships in the Soviet Navy has been declining slightly. When this edition of Guide to the Soviet Navy was meant to press additional Rapusha class landing ships, a design of the Elegant Assemblies, were being built in Poland for the Soviet Navy. While a third large amphibious ship of the long gestation Ivan Roganov class has been completed at Kalingrad, the political and economic events in Poland, however, make questionable if many more Rapusha LSTs or other major amphibious ships will be constructed in the near future. Soviet amphibious capabilities for short-range operations are being increased considerably. Through acquisition of large air cushion landing craft and the all-land class wing and ground effect of WIG vehicles. Um, except for the Roganovs, all large Soviet amphibious ships, LST, LSM types, have been constructed in Poland. Troop capacity. The troop capacity listed for amphibious ships is the number for which berths are provided. A larger number could be carried in all class amphibious ships for short transits. Or, oh, in other words, if you're not going to worry about where people are sleeping. Hmm. 
the Ivan Roganov class, three were built to this point, completed 1978, 1982, and 1989. Ivan Roganov, Alexander Nikolov, Mikhorov, Irfan, Moslankel. Displacement, 11,000 tons in standard, 13,000 tons full load. Length, 150 meter, 8 meters. Beam, 24 meters. Draft, 8.2 meters. Propulsion, two gas turbines providing 48,600 shaft horsepower, are driving two shafts. The top speed of 23 knots, or 8,000 nautical miles at 10, 20 knots, or 12,500 nautical miles at 14 knots. Approximately 200 comp crew. Approximately 525 troops carried. Approximately four KA-27 Helix B helicopters carried. Missiles, rockets, one twin SAN Air 4 anti-air launcher, two quad SAN-6 or SAN-5 or SAN-8 anti-air launchers with 16 to 80, with a 16 to 20 um, missiles, 20 missiles for a twin SAN-4, uh, one 140 tube 122 millimeter barrage rocket launcher, Two guns, two 76.2 millimeter 59 cal uh, dual purpose, that's one twin mount, and four 30 millimeter close in, four multi barrel systems. Mounted, broadly speaking, amidships on superstructure. These are the largest and most versatile amphibious ships yet constructed for the Soviet Navy. Each ship can embark a naval infantry battalion, including its vehicles and equipment. They are also the only amphibious ships with a helicopter facility. The first two ships are assigned to the Pacific Fleet. The third ship was in the Baltic when this addition went to press. Class, the second ship was uh, completed four years after the first uh, and unit. The third ship was delivered seven years after the second. Classification, Soviet BDK type des design. These are multi-role amphibious ships, having bow vehicle ramps, a floodable deck well, de decking, a docking well for landing craft, amphibious tractors, and a helicopter hangar with two landing decks, forward and abaft of the stupor structure. The hangar can accommodate four Helix helicopters, formula KA-25 hormone Cs. They can be moved through the superstructure and down a ramp to the forward landing area. The funnel up takes a split to provide the helicopter pass through. The float-in docking, uh, uh, float docking well can hold three Liebed uh, air cushion landing craft or six Ondorata uh, conventional landing craft. The ship was, uh, has a flat bottom and large tank deck with bow doors permitting the unloading of fuse vehicles onto the water or across the beach. Ten light or medium tanks plus 30 armoured personnel carriers can be transported. The barrage rocket launcher is mounted atop a four-level structure offset to starboard, forward of the, uh, the main superstructure. The four Gatling guns are mounted alongside the pylon mast. There is a four-level stack of canisters containing life rafts arranged outboard of the rocket launcher structure. Electronics. Mozelenko has a roundhouse Takan installation. Names. Ivan Roganov was a political officer and chief of the main political directorate of the Soviet Navy during World War II. Alexander Nikiev was the chief political officer of the Northern Fleet during World War II. Migafan Mozelenko was the logistics chief of the Baltic Fleet during World War II. Operational, the lead ship, the Ivan Raganov, was transferred to the Pacific Fleet in 1979 with the aircraft carrier Minsk. She returned to the Baltic in the fall of 1981 for the Zapad amphibious exercises. Nikolaev transferred to the Pacific Fleet in late 1983, followed by the Raganov in late 1986. It is a very interesting book with full of very, very cool details. And if you want to understand what the Soviet Navy and what we were building to fight towards the end of the Cold War, you have to. Uh, this book is a great example and a great thing to give uh, to give you information. Um, it's cool. I'll leave that here for a second while I change it to questions then. Right, let's see. 
Our questions we got. Um, Carl Harmon, I bet you wish your railways could pick up your books for you. Um, we'll see what I can manage to design into the uh, into the bookshelves. Unfortunately, I doubt my little N-gauge train can do it. But maybe when I can um, have a bigger office, office and can have, I don't know, G-gauge probably going around, possibly could design a system which would push the books out if they all went into certain positions, so I could push the book out onto a truck which would take, carry it. With RF, uh, turn around time, I repeat all in all session, RFID flags on tags on the books. You think I wouldn't try that if I thought it would work in this house? Turn to Lanko. Soviet tactics versus the USN showed they read US and Okinawa the war directories not later than the 1960s. Hmm. Trent Lanko, Soviet Northern Fleet bombers and bear bombers were using chaff tactics identical to what the IJN need used versus US's Bush on Okinawa Pocket Station. And they might have been a similar response to a similar circumstance. When was Palmer's book written? Uh, first edition, 1986. This revision, uh, this edition, 1991. Remember, it's five editions, so they kept rewriting it every couple of years. Um... Danru, knowing what we know now, what tweaks would you make to the Cold War RNUSN to counter the Soviet Navy? Knowing what we know now. Mm. Oh, you need to push close in weapon systems up in earlier, but um, I would have... <sighs> You see, it's the, the knowing what we know now. Is this based on uh, the question? Is if it's if I'm basing it on the fact that I know the war doesn't go hot, so I know I'm going to keep having to fight a presence war around the world, then building especially more Type eighty twos Bristols rather than building Type forty twos, um, building sort of the modified Bristol with the Seawolf and the Sea Dart mix makes a lot more sense, because I need to have a global presence, because I'm fighting a global influence war. But if I don't know, so if I know that, then that's one of the first things I'd change. I would say if I was the USN, again, I'd be building more cruisers. In terms of, I wouldn't be relying on the Tikarongas, I would build something bigger than a Tiko. Um, they're, built, they're relying on everything on their Arleigh Burks, basically, become their mass-produced unit, but... Mm. And I would, I would also, uh, I I would have more SSKs. I, SSKs, you see, the, having the nuke boats is great. The nuke boats are excellent, but if I want to do a barrier operation and really block up the Russians, SSKs and having them would put make them paranoid enough because. The thing is with nuke boats is they realize that they are good for the long range operations. But what do I want to block up? I want to block the U I want to block the Soviet Navy into north of Norway. I don't want them coming down the Norwegian coast and being able to support the Third Shock Army in Norway. I also want to make them paranoid about it, so they're even more paranoid about it in Sumer Warfare than they already are. SSKs are a great way of making someone paranoid about ASW. Because when they're running on their electrics, they are invisible. So, Thompson, what makes you think she hasn't already read the printed version of your of your um, submission? <laughs> it came in before Christmas. <laughs> oh. It's a uh, rapid uh, back. The Mints was a carrier. And then we need to reclassify to start uh, classify stuff to Kiev's about as close to carrier missile cruiser hybrid as you will find. Uh, probably. Engelbert 42. Changing stuff always changes the timeline. Yep. 
Dai Kongaroga. At that moment, I think the Type 82 production, as opposed to the Bristol prototype, just makes sense versus the Type 42. And as, uh, I'm sad that the lessons from the Falcons War was error to build any more uh, uh, error to build any more Type 42s. Type 42s was still in production at that point. I think um, it, they were still in production. That's the thing. So they just produced more of them, and they produced more Type 22s as well. Come on, so rapid as Soviet aviation cruisers are lip service to Bosphorus treaties and necessities to have own weapons in confined waters of Black and Baltic Sea. That they are. Rapraiser. Excessive Russian paranoia leads to bad decision making and purges. I know. Tends to be useful. Lesson of the Napoleonic Wars. If you can get the enemy to kill off their own officer class and experienced per operators in favor of people who are politically reliable, you win. <laughs> it's brilliant. Let's be honest, half the trouble the Red Army has at the beginning of World War II, uh, when it starts fighting in World War II against the Germans, is the fact that their senior officer, quite a lot of their officer corps, are, um, have been killed in various Stalin's purges. Come, I still prayed Type 82 HS Bristol to save the Made Museum. I, I doubt it will be, but it's oh, a nice dream. So, Thompson, with more 82s coming online, do you think the would have taken the Kirovs more seriously? Yes. I think if you want to break the Russian economy, you build bigger ships, because they're going to keep build, trying to build bigger ones to build bigger ones than you. So, you know. I don't consider the Kirovs as much a threat as many some people think, because I happen to realize, I think that the Royal Navy would have... Made them target numero uno with spearfish torpedoes and various other things, and Mark Eights if they'd had to, uh, a la Concra and Belgrano. So I am not as worried about those as I as other people are, but I think they do a lot of economic damage to the Russians, and they cause them to have to spend a lot of money tying themselves up in a few units. So if the Royal Navy is building Bristol-sized destroyers, and the U.S. Navy is building slightly bigger cruisers. Bigger than the Tikong um, then they have a problem. And it's a very big problem. About 10 more minutes, and I've got to go, well, actually have some tea. So far today, I've had a nice cooked breakfast, which was kind of late, almost, almost lunchtime, and um, haven't eaten really properly since. So uh, I, I will try and get some tea before I go to bed. Carmen, one can dream, Doctor. One can always dream, yes. Dylan, uh, Dylan Lair, would you have made any changes to the UK ASW fleet in World War II, i.e. bigger, smaller ships, more frigates, more corvettes? I'd love to have, you'd, you'd love to have more of them, but honestly, the biggest change I would make if I could to the ASW fleet in World War II is I would start the production of, the mass production of sloops that they were planning in they had planned to do 19, to be ready for 1942 to 44, or 44, and hoping a war was going to be 1944. So they put off the production of sloops and decided to call them corvettes at a certain point in mass production till about 19... Well, they started already in 1938, and they started production in 1939. I would have... The, if I'd have been in charge and had some foresight, or even if I'd just been in charge anyway, I would probably have pointed out that these ships do not trigger the treaties, they cost very little, and if I can start mass-producing them now, they're going to last me a, few, a fair number of years in reserve and still be viable, so let's churn them out. And I would have been matching... 
I would have had a sloop flotilla built every year to match the destroyer flotillas. So for every single destroyer built from 1928 onwards, I would have a sloop built. And the sloop would be able to be used as a minesweeper, anti-submarine warfare, all these things. The only requirement is, of course, it doesn't have the ability to go faster than 20 knots. Well, it isn't designed to go faster than 20 knots. We all know the truth of that one. And doesn't carry a certain number of gu certain guns and all these things. But that would have given me a very strong anti-submarine warfare escort force in place already. I would have done that, and I would have also probably made sure that there were several suitable... Um, Merchant ships built, which I could rapidly convert into escort carriers. Eric Carlton, wasn't that basically what Regan did with Star Wars? Outspend them to outbreak them? Yes. Just didn't do it sort of the naval side as well as he could have done. So if you want to build a ridiculous budget busting uh, warship, let's dust off the Tillman era until uh, uh, the Tillman and give it missiles. Oh my god, no one be that stupid that insane. Although if the Americans did it, you could guarantee the Russians would have to build one bigger. It would be glorious. Coming up soon. So and Doug Clark, another uh, build from the episode, the Soviet Russian unexpected asymmetric answers to Western challenges. Oh, that could be fun. Drak and me have similar opinions on some of them. But uh, on others, we have quite different ones. So, one sausage with free coffees. Yeah, you're up on me on food wise. I probably am, but Stafford, you should be eating a lot more, considering my day has been spent just clearing a little bit of snow off a drive, taking a dog for a walk, sorting out books, doing some writing, and wandering around a um, half constructed a gar a garden office going. That's not what's supposed to be there. Hmm. Someone on Discord was looking for a good book on Empress Augustus ba Augusta Bain, World War Two. Any ideas beside a uh, beside a Burt biography? No, Burt biography is probably the best way to go. Merchant carriers aren't they? What the RN is kind of building now. Let's not talk about the literal strike ships. Uh, they can, they, they're going through some interesting changes. There are lots of talk about them. I have a, suspi a suspicion about what they will turn into. And about five minutes to the end. So as I said, I'll, I'll go about 10 o'clock. Have a good day, Doctor, and good night. Thank you, John Chair. So I've got time for a few more questions. <laughs> Be four hours long, I think, this evening. I'm not sure. Hmm, roughly. You're still waiting for your poster of Jack, Carl. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> If you doesn't, if you want to outbuild the USSR, try HMS Havoc class. Nah, you don't need to outbuild the USSR, you need to make them try to outbuild you. Good night, Carl guys. I guess well. Thank you. Come on, on Wednesday I didn't eat till 3 p.m. That's not good. That's not sensible. And I know the son. I'm I I I'm pretty bad at forgetting to eat. And my Poor girlfriend probably worries about me far more than she should be continuing to be focusing on our things now, remembering to eat. But, you know, it happens. Carmen, wait, the RN is building an LCS? Not an LCS. Literal, uh, the literal strike ships, um, LSS. And the idea is basically you have a special forces operations ship which can take a company of marines and all sorts of things but they're, they're talking about upgrading it to take more than a company of marines and they're talking about what kind of aircraft it needs to fly it, whether it can be helicopters or whether it's going to need fixed wing aviation or it's all sorts of things how heavy a sh vehicle a, a landing craft does it need to land vehicles because currently designed it wouldn't have the ability to land vehicles but let's be honest we're going it, the smaller the force the more likely they're going to need organic vehicles and what kind of apcs are we going to get and uh the, 
by the time it enters service, who knows what it's going to be. Don't know, I keep working through lunch, expect to leave on time, and then staying too late. You are a doctor, Dan. You are supposed to lead by example. You're a medical doctor. I'm a history doctor. I'm supposed to get lost in time. You're not. Start eating properly, or at least have a Snickers bar. Uh, Razor, to win a Cold War, discard, uh, the Cold War, discard fiscal responsibility. <clears throat> Wind up your opponent so they discard fiscal responsibility. Thank you, Albert Zasky. <laughs> Carmen, what can I say? My nan passed. I had no appetite. I understand that. But still, your nan would want you to keep, take care of yourself. It's one good thing I do. One thing I do know about family. They do like to make sure they take care of themselves. Professor, <sighs> the Iron Concept has Mission Creek written all over it. Yep. Done for him. I am leading by example, and I'm making sure my junior colleagues go home on time, and I get through a lot of cereal bars. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's good, Dan. You have to ask the thing, the old advance of doctors. First, take care of yourself so you can take care of the patients. You're a good doctor. You're a very good gentleman and a very kind natured soul. I know this because I've wandered around, uh, wandered around the um, Fleet Air Arm Museum with you, chatting away. Take care of yourself. Come. Um, why don't they just have one type hull where they can do both? I make one inch of course and have lengthened version with more than one company. Oh, because they're never going to do that. And also they're talking about whether they're going to have to build three ships rather than two ships. And I have a feeling that this could end up being an LHD of a ski ramp. And then we have three ships and five flight decks, which can all take F-35s. Well, hey. Or whatever, whatever goes along with them. Right then. And I'm guessing the LSS are for Marines, SAS, SBS, and Parachute Regiment. Uh, for Royal Marines, uh, SBS, and possibly SAS. I doubt the Parachute Regiment will want to get in on. Stefan, speaking of Snickers, you're gifted with leaving on. Oh, thank you. <sighs> Peter Dawson, I do love that joke. Right. It is now 10 o'clock. I can hear doggy swoofing. I'm going to go and sort out some food. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And I will. On Tuesday, the Long Patrol will come out about paintings. And I have a nice load of submissions. And I will also be setting up and turning out the patron vote this week. Anyway, take care. Thank you. And uh, the patron vote that is for February's. Um, February's patron choices. So if you have got a, a, a suggestion for what topics we should be covering in February, please go and you're a patron, please go to the uh, go to the appropriate page in the pay in the patron system and put in your your suggestions. Thank you very much and take care. Carmen, how's even build uh, building even free ships even a discussion? <sighs> They built two aircraft carriers. Just don't get just don't get Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you, Carl Kasberg. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And um No, I won't feed myself to doggy. Don't worry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.